never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there was a building hardly standing. Okay, today we are doing a second interview with Ron Klute of Wyoming, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Ron, in your first uh, session, we covered basically your uh, initial uh, training and uh, duties and then working with, with the CIA initially and then uh, going into the Army uh, and through for your first two tours in Vietnam. Now, just by way of reminder, again, what were those first two tours? What were your assignments? The first tour was the one in the Combined Intelligence Center in Saigon, which was a combined uh, uh, organization, including both Vietnamese and American, uh, and basically all services too, uh, trying to do, you know, making order of battle type information and studies. The second tour, was as an advisor, again working with Vietnamese, up in the Highlands area. Uh, I was an S-2 advisor with a Vietnamese captain uh, in charge of, con basically he collected uh, intelligence on enemy activity in his province and I was there to uh, be a recipient of that stuff and help him financially and stuff like that. All right, and the dates that we have for you there, the first two were sort of September of 66 to September of 67 uh, and then uh, the, the next one listed as November 67 into March 68. Uh, and then you had a gap there until June of 68? Right, I was at school. Okay, and then June 68 through June 69. Uh, that's the rest of that second tour? That was the second tour. It's from June. Uh, actually, I arrived in country on the 1st of June of 68. Okay. And I, I left in uh, J June of 69 right. on, so on 30 days leave. Well, it's actually what we call an ITT, intertheater transfer. I extended for another tour uh, from that second tour and got 30 days leave to go home and then went back and arrived in July and served from July uh, 69 through July 70. All right. Uh, now, what was then the assignment on this third tour? The third tour was uh, with the 1st Cavalry Division. In fact, that's what I wanted to go to. I, I extended pre, uh, specifically to go to that. And in that job, I, would, I came in and, of course, uh, whereas the first, second tour was sort of, you know, peaks and valleys, this one was constant peaks. In other words, I was busy. I got in and they, uh, you get, I got a marching order and uh, you said, you're the ground order battle section chief. You're replacing this captain and these two lieutenants. They'll be leaving. And they left the same or the next day. And I got, well, I've, been, I've done this work before, so I didn't need them except to get a short briefing on what they had, how they've been having the operation. But the G2 uh, who wanted through the G2, which is a Colonel Barrett, which I met in subsequent years at the reunion sort of things. Uh, I dealt with his assistant, Charlie Wilson, the major, and says the colonel wants you to or get this place running on the 24-7 operation. Uh, I wanted to, a systematic organization. And, and having done that work down in Saigon and, and other jobs, I said, okay, fine. Uh, and then I had to come up with a proposal of how many people would take to run two, two, uh, two tricks, 12-hour tricks or shifts. Shifts, yes. Uh, and they call them tricks in mm -hmm. my first job in uh, Japan years earlier. But you had to, I had to get two 24-hour, uh, two 12-hour shifts, and I had to have supervision on each one, a lieutenant on each one. I didn't get the second officer until later, but we had it too. And I had a NCOIC who was overall uh, the, uh, for the enlisted soldiers. And then uh, the, uh, they had, uh, I had to add people to fill out what we, the design. The design was to cover all possible things re, relating to enemy activity in, the, in the, our area. That is, local uh, enemy, VC, uh, NVA divisions, NVA echelons above division, uh, infiltration, this sort of thing. Right. Now, at this point, where was 1st Cavalry based? 
in the third military region, which used to be known as Third Corps, which is uh, uh, north of Saigon. The base camp was Phuc Vinh, which is uh, just north of the Binh Zung River. And, uh, and then, of course, the Song Bay, which is the, comes down and feeds into that, and it goes down towards the Saigon River in Saigon. Mm -hmm. But that, that's uh, Binh Zung uh, province, and Phuc Vinh is the, is the city we were in. Okay. Uh, now, what kind of, of terrain was in that area? Well, this was flat, rice paddies, little town was right outside the gate. Uh, to the south was a jungle, was what they call War Zones uh, D. Uh, uh, that extended down into the next province and into Binh Zoom too, but uh, uh, to the south, I call it to the south. Uh, and then uh, it was flat. And there's, uh, but to the edges, there was always jungle in the area. And uh, <clears throat> to the north, there were some rice paddies that the locals uh, uh, farmed, which is an interesting story. And they, they, as you know, uh, Asians use the water buffalo to do their plowing for it. And, uh, but <laughs> I'm maybe they're guessing in the time, I mean, uh, going forward or back too much, or forward too much, but uh, the, that posed a problem later on when... Uh, we had a, a unit assigned part of us, which had electronic sensors, acoustic sensors, and that stuff, and they set it on major trails of enemy activity. Uh, of course, the one night, the water buffalo herd, which belonged to the village, they keep the boy, young boys, you've seen your pictures of Asia, young people watched the animals, uh, went down a trail, one of these trails, and the, the, the guys in the room who keep track of this on their devices see these, the little dots coming up, you know, looking like, hey, they're going down this action. Well, the next thing I knew, you hear, boom, the artillery goes off, and the big 8-inch guns, just 8-inch, by the way, is, it was the most accurate mm -hmm. uh, 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 howitzer in s Southeast Asia. Could hit, hit a, you know, on a dime. Uh, start blasting, and next morning the the uh, natives were at the gates, so to speak, and very angry because we had destroyed 28 of their water buffalo. But that's but it was there were rice paddies, and then again you go north more and you run into into uh, the jungle more, to just to the in fact part of this area where the base camp was in was the rubber plantation. Uh, and uh, the hooches, my ca our, our buildings that the MI company uh, was in, as were other units in the area that were sort of parallel with us, were in rubber, the rubber plantation, which of course was not operational anymore. And uh, <coughs> I've flown over it numerous times. It's really pretty country in that area. Uh, and I've done reconnaissance in war zone D too. Now, were you uh, kind of attached to the divisional headquarters yes. where you were? Yes. Actually, I worked for the G2. Uh, under the concept of a military intelligence company, it was a detachment, but it expanded to become a company. Uh, it's configured to support the G2 section in the, uh, uh, of the division. Okay, and for lay people, what does G2 refer to? Intelligence. She's a chief intelligence officer for the division. He is normally, uh, at least at that time, a lieutenant colonel. He is assisted. He could have an assistant. And this one was, of course, the major I refer to as Charlie Wilson. He was a counterintelligence guy, but he was a good officer. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed, really a f f fine person to work for. Now, what kind of activity was going on in that area while you were there? Well, I, I jumped into the frying pan. In early, early uh, August of, uh, of 1969, the enemy conducted a major offensive in the military region three area. The CAV had responsible for the whole broad uh, uh, width of it from the border of Cambodia and, uh, uh, and Tainin I say to my left, all the way up to the two-core border, 
uh, uh, through Fuklong, and then from Binzung, those provinces like Tainan, Binlong, Fuklong, Binzung, to the, no to, the mm -hmm. to the Cambodian border. And they start uh, the activity started in in Binlong province, major uh, ninth 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 uh, VC division wasn't really VC anymore, but that's mm -hmm. what they call it. Uh, and others attacked on our bi division base camp, our, our, our brigade base camp up in Anlock, Quang Loi. 11th ACR was up there too, 11th uh, Army uh, Armored Cavalry Unit, uh, and really a major attack. So we were just going, in fact, they sent up a task force, Shoemaker they called it, to go up there and coordinate the activity at that place because they, 11th was working, was I think uh, operational control of the CAV at that time for this particular area. And uh, I, they wanted to take somebody to work on his, the General Shoemaker's staff. Fortunately, I did get taken. Not, I, I mean, I just say that, but I, until I get my feet on, really on the ground, I didn't really want to go up there, but uh, uh, they, they really went through hell. I mean, it was bad. They they almost overrun the base camp up there, and this just this activity just after that was over. There's another infiltration coming up from uh, down in War Zone D up into up into uh, uh, the Fuklong Province along the uh, near the Cambodia or uh, the uh, boundary between Bin Long and Fuklong. There's an infiltration quarter, and. Uh, there was a, a the NVA 5th VC division called v, uh, VC, but uh, there was activity October, November, December. It just seemed to happen because all of the, uh, the division covered a major mm -hmm. geographic area in three corps. Okay. Now, were the uh, line companies uh, anywhere near full strength, or were they all? I don't kn know about that. I know that my experience I'd, up in up in uh, two corps, I talked to the third battalion, 503rd Infantry, 73rd Airborne Brigade. Uh, I, ta I had, I, I did, I was de facto S2 for a period of time. I talked to the, to the commander and also the ex, his deputy, and they, and they said, well, we only get about 76 soldiers fit for duty at any one time. And the company has got an authorized strength of, uh, I think it had uh, the, uh, the battalion of, a uh, company had an uh, 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 authorized strength of about 140 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I can't project, but when you think of wounded, uh, rest and R&Rs and, &R and other things like that, I would, it's possible that this could be common throughout mm -hmm. Vietnam. But that on that ba basic thing, and he sort of felt that this was normal for the rest. I mean, you had a. Uh, uh, it's. I never. I having saw the having seen, the movie. We were soldiers, and having met General Moore, and Joe Galloway. And having discussions on the first CAV, then known the Eleventh Air Assault, when it was created. Or re -as, re resurrected as the eleventh, because mm -hmm. that was in World War Two. Also, they came with uh, with over seventy percent of the original people they had when they started training, mm -hmm. and they stayed that way till they left. Till later on, when they started feeding in individual replacements into these units, which with all these things like R and Rs and wounded and People are still carried on the books. Uh, it's hard, was hard to uh, get any continuity in this, and, and that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a problem. But in general, it sounds like the division was really spread too thin. Oh yeah. To, to kind of do. But it was do. fun. I mean, not fun, but exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, and and because you had the, uh, a factor which going for you, which the line outfits didn't have, is you had. Boku or many helicopters. You could, uh, technically speaking, you could jump, you could air assault a full brigade at one time if necessary into any target area. 
and and uh, you have all the support. You got the helicopters, the artillery, so all at one time, boom, go. Whereas the line people don't have that. They got to take trucks, or mm -hmm. they got to do only small elements. To have. The division had a lot of helicopters. They could cover a lot of area with that air mobility. Mm -hmm. and that was the the proof of the pudding with air mobility was the fact it could cover a larger area with helicopters. The enemy had a had a react faster and therefore couldn't plan as thorough uh, what they're going to do because they get somebody would find out about it. It was spread all over. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, describe basically what uh, you, you talk. Your initial duty when you get there w was simply to, to organize and, right. and set up the units. Uh, my my so section. Forth. Right. Yeah. To get get that up and going. And then once they are up and going, what are you actually doing on a day to day basis? What I'm actually doing on a day to day basis is one. I came in to the office first thing in the morning. And let me just go aside here a minute. We we had a re arrangement with Saigon Document Exploitation Center, that for all the documents we captured today could get set down to Saigon by a liaison, and we get back at the end, uh, the following, you, know, you take it down in the following day, you would get cursory translations of these documents as to what they contain, or if they're if even they, the center, could determine that they're very important, they translate the whole things. They would come back, and we'd get, I get, a, they get a stack uh, like this. Now the problem was that I'm dealing with these guys who were just coming in. You know, the troops I got, there a whole new staff came in of kids, good kids, but they don't have the the institutional memory. So I, I screened all that stock of documents. I had a pencil. And I'd take, this is important, that, and then I'd, I'd, uh, I'd put them in piles, send to this guy, send to that guy, send to this. And I did the screening of all the documents as they come in. And then, uh, that's during the day, first thing in the morning. Uh, I had a lieutenant, uh, I had two lieutenants initially. Uh, one was named... Uh, Hag, Hagger, 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 or something like that. And the other one was Donnie Anderson. He was supposed to be my day section, day team leader. And then this other guy would have been the night one, but he he figured that uh, since he was airborne uh, qualified, that ranger qualified, that this was below him. Uh, and so he transferred, and I don't know where he transferred to, so that left me with one officer. So what I did was, is I still maintained the day thing, but I made, I made a, a lieutenant. He'd be the basically the night shift leader, Anderson Donnie. Well, that that didn't work from the from the get go because Donnie, nice kid, inexperienced, you know, one of these ninety day wonders. Uh, didn't know what he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I mentor, I'm supposed to mentor him, but, you know, you're, this is a war zone. This is not stateside, nice, comfortable air conditioning, nice desks, clean uniforms, and stuff like that. This is a combat zone. You're getting mortared and rocketed. Sometimes once a week, sometimes twice, uh, they're enemy just loved to lob them in on the helicopter pads. And of course, we're in the way of the helicopter pads. So things could hit the, hit the, uh, uh, the uh, trees, the rubber trees, and they go off premature, and the stuff spreads and all over the place. You hear it on the roofs and the things like that. Uh, anyway, so I figured, well, he can handle this. And, and, uh, and if, like most, in, my experience was, when I in, when I start out as a second lieutenant, is just to dive into my job and find all I can because I'm going to be held responsible for this. This kid never picked up on that, mm -hmm. and so I got called. I, I, I do well. I do the every study that went out. I had to prove. And at first, it was it was it was a major job, because in addition to teaching how to do their job, I had to proofread everything they did and to make sure that it met, you know, met the criteria for the, the G2. 
And that was the filter between the requirements coming down from G2 to the various teams. And, uh, you know, somebody, oh, well, we need this. And I said, Del, well, specifically, what do you want? And, and I talked to the sergeant, and he, he, he'd uh, organize the troops and get. But I had to teach the kids how, what they're supposed to do, too, teaching. And Sergeant, sergeant uh, Hodge was a benefit, too, because he had an old MI guy. And he, he got along well with those troops. And, and, and you know, I just introduced, this is what you got to do, and he would pick up on it. Mm -hmm. So I would do that. Anything time they wanted something, uh, they'd call you up. Uh, the lieutenant was the night shift. Well, the problem was that they, the product that was supposed to go out in the daily major division summary, every, every night by midnight, they'd got to transmit electronically and report on all activities within the division area. Everything. Mm -hmm intelligence included. Our job was to provide intelligence comments, I mean the data that from the files, you know, what this means or possibly means. <coughs> so uh, he was, that was lieutenant, he was his responsible for synthesizing all this stuff and uh, the problem was that he'd take it up there and the first thing they do is they call me up. So it got, it started out, like I said, uh, I'd go in in the morning, first thing, and usually it was, I was up by six and going into the office and I never got to bed, most cases, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And that, and then the, that doesn't include getting awake, getting awakened by incoming and that. Uh, so basically, I, the lieutenant just really didn't know how to synthesize the material or what to pull out of he it. He never had any training. Mm -hmm. He never went through any course. They, they, were, th they were shoving these people through. Uh, he went through a course, his officer basic course, but apparently he didn't pick up anything. And, and, and because you get commissioned, that doesn't mean you're a leader. Mm -hmm. You have to develop that. And, and, uh, and, and I, I can understand this maybe a little bit. He was a little bit... Uh, uh, inhibited because he was, didn't feel comfortable. But, uh, you know, you learn by mistakes and you, you got to take the bull by the horn. That's why you're supposed to be an officer. I mean, I could I get more work out of a sergeant than, you can, than him, and he's getting more pay. But, uh, so I got so where I just, I, I stayed up until that report went to, what we said, went to press and made sure it was done. So you were doing part of his job, and you were also essentially doing the job of the lieutenant you should have had in the day shift, but you didn't have one. I didn't have one, right. Okay. That would be exhausting. It would. And, and, and of course, Sergeant Hodge, I, I, I don't think I could handle without his taking care of the troops. He was a, he was a Texan, mm -hmm. tall, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the troop now who had an attitude problem. And he told me, Sir, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I had one troop that didn't like his job, so he'd, he'd disappear. How, no, you can't disappear in base camp, go back to the uh, company area. But uh, they found him in the uh, men's room uh, reading uh, literally Sergeant Rock comic books. And Sergeant uh, uh, Hodge gave him a father and son talk. So, I mean, he, he would, any kid got belligerent with him, he just... So about how old was uh, Sergeant Hodge at the time? Uh, 30s. Okay. So he'd, be he'd been in the Army a long time. He's a, he was E-7. He made Sergeant Major before he retired. And, uh, but he was a, a real and old, old soldier. Okay. Very handy. Now, you mentioned that while well, you're, you're, you're there, and this is sort of division base camp, so yeah. a relatively secure area, but you're being rocketed or mortared on a regular basis? Yeah. Okay. What kind of physical defenses did you have? Did you have permanent bunkers or just sandbags? Or we had bunkers behind the hooch. That's the quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I li I, my sleeping area was just a bunk. I had a cot right next to the back door. To the, and the, all these were sea hut type things with louvers and screening. Mm -hmm. And I had a mosquito net on as double uh, screen. And I had a little foot locker. And I had a fan, which 
I got at the PX, probably illegally because I didn't have authorization by the uh, headquarters commandant, because you're on electrical power furnished by generators, so there's limited uh, electrical power available. And uh, you got to get a permission to get a fan, but uh, uh, my friend who lives up now by, uh, what's it, the Pike Lake or P whatever lake up there near Sparta, Pine Lake, uh, not Pine Lake. That's no, a sure. funny name. Uh, he and I went into the PX. And uh, I give him one of these. Uh, I hear to pick up, a, I want to get a fan, and yeah, uh, here's the money. And I already mm -hmm. knew, knew what I wanted. And I, ha I, I, I talk so fast, and, and John was, yeah, I'm right. And well, let's go. We've got to hurry. And so the poor E4, he just, he didn't think you know, that I'm supposed to show him that. So I paid the money and I was out the door and he probably didn't know who I was. So I had that fan. So the fan sat on my locker. It's a blessing because it's hot. Uh, you had a, a road in the back of there and you had a bunker, huge bunker. Each, each building had a bunker between the road and uh, the next bunker, the next uh, bunker, and it, each hooch had yeah. one. Uh, I never went into it. Even while you're being bombarded? or no. Did they just shoot one or two rockets or mortar rounds and then stop? No, they shoot some, but some would be low, and it hit the, artil hit the, the bamboo, I mean the uh, rubber plantation, mm -hmm. and then pre-detonate. Okay. They were after the helicopters, which right. were down the road a bit. Uh, well, the... Ri this is maybe sounds stupid. Uh, one, I've been there three years. And you can get excited so often, but you can't get excited all the time. I mean, I, mean, I'm not, I never was one to panic, but I'm not going to rush around and try to do something. I came to the conclusion, if you hear it and it lands, you're alive. So forget it. Uh, secondly, there were snakes, and the snakes loved the bunkers because mm -hmm. they were dry. And my troops said to me, Sir, we got that. you remember the mortar I said? There was a cobra in the bunker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That that's put the frosting on the cake. <laughs> I refused to go in them, and I never did go. For, subsequently, I never went into another bunker in my military tour over in the second, the follow-on mm -hmm. tour either. I mean, they're snakes. I hate snakes. Cobras, particularly, and, and, and bamboo vipers were dangerous, too. Uh, did you ever get shrapnel or anything coming in through your huge? The only shrapnel I got is when the grenade, the, the, the fragging we had, uh, and it didn't hit me. The, it blew the, the, the thing went off, off the peak of the, the, the incident evolved in, in February, about February uh, 70, mm -hmm. when for a period there in December and January, we had no commander. Uh, Major Brittnell, who, small world, back in 2000, or one, uh, 1995, I run into, this is 70, 95, mm -hmm. he was a brigadier general, just got off of a tour uh, as a, as a, uh, a USD, or as a USDAO in Brasilia, Brazil, and was taking over, because the intelligence taking over uh, that unit I, that was formed, the Defense Human Service, which I was a member of mm -hmm. for a year and a half. Anyway, he had went home on emergency leave because his only sole surviving parent, his mother, was, had a major physical problem. So they left him. They left him. We had no commander. Mm -hmm. Well, in that, uh, a company commander in, a MI, in a M, uh, one of these type of units, where you're not out in the field operating as a company, you know, combat or anything, mm -hmm. but supporting staff sections. Like mine belonged to the, G, uh, the G2 himself, and then you had the II section belong to the G2, uh, also the G2. Uh, we had a, a map board, you know, we had, the, we had a interrogation, you know, it's all part of the G2. So uh, it could get along without having uh, a company commander who takes care of uh, vehicles and mm -hmm. watches vehicles and keeps it clean. 
and that you rely on the first sergeant if there isn't one. And you may even put, in normal situations in peacetime, if you're gone, you have a, you're, you'll get a, a, someone to sit in, temporarily anyway, he, on orders. He's now in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, I had that when I was sick in the hospital after my first tour. Uh, I was in there for two weeks. I had to appoint somebody on orders to be the commander. Okay. So at this point, though, you don't have a commander. Chaos begins to creep in very slowly. We had a subsequent in January or early February, well, I can't remember exactly when specific time frame, but it had to be January, February time frame. We had a what they call IG inspection. Now you got to understand, it's not like stateside IG inspection or, you know, where you, everything's got to be fit and polished and everything in the, you know, periods and commas and hyphens or whatever. This was very, just to check to see how everything is going. Well, everything was not going well. The bunkers were, the, uh, uh, the sandbags and stuff that are surround, they had barrels full of, it was sandbags on top of deteriorating grasses were getting, and uh, things were just falling apart phys physically for the, uh, the concern, uh, for our area, I mean, and uh, the, ins the inspectors didn't like that. So, of course, the, the G2 is, gets a piece of paper. Your, your area is ship shape, not sh shaped up. Get, get it done. So he has to, uh, he has to appoint, he has to uh, appoint something, someone. And so he appoints this Major McMurdy, which I mentioned in some of the writing, to become the detachment commander or company commander. We were originally a detachment, we became right. a company. Anyway, he's in charge. Well, his problem is, is he doesn't like this Monday. He, he's got dreams of, of glory and whatever. And I've read, I'm not run into people like that. And he doesn't like to get down into the nitty gritty like that. So, he would spend most of his time up in the, up in the G2, uh, keeping track of what's going on because mm -hmm. he figures he's someday going to be, well, be bigger and better. In the process, he's not really supervising down in the company, getting this, these things corrected. He said, oh, First Sergeant, uh, I want you to do, you know, we got to do this. And so First Sergeant, who's too busy with a hooch maid, uh, you ever heard that term before? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have. Uh, says, First Field First Sergeant, you, I want you to organize the details and I want you to uh, have use uh, people coming off the night shift and then the day shift after they get off. I want to get all these sand, new new sandbags and clean the area up, get rid of the grass and whatever. So people who are working 12-hour shifts before they go on or off, they're filling sandbags to repair the bunkers. Oh yes, that goes over well. And uh, as a result, there was troops would talk to me. Now, the blame for this. Uh, the troops would, of course, when you, it's another thing. When you have a person like McMurdy, who is in love with himself, is very arrogant, uh, young soldiers pick this thing up. And, uh, and I'd get the information from Conti, one of the troops, and the others at McMurdy. You know, they blame him, McMurdy, for everything. And, and, and they, would gr they were grumbling. And so I, I, I had a choice here. You know, he wouldn't listen to me at all. So, and he wasn't, and, and the redeeming feature on this, he wasn't in my rating chain at all, so that's at this time. So you weren't answering directly to him? Him, precisely. Yeah. So I went up to my boss, literal boss, the, uh, Major Wilson, and said, this is the problem. And uh, McMurdy is a problem. Uh, oh, I said, he said, told me, keep track. Well, uh, late February, they're starting uh, throwing rocks on the roof of the, of the uh, hooch we were in because there were tin roofs. They, and it sounds like a grenade. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, uh, the night, one night, 
I had got back at 10.30, which I thought was relatively early at night, and dashed down to the, to the shower point, which by that time the water is, is uh, not warm, it's just tepid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, watching the, the praying mantises catch moths in the shower point, these are big mantises too. And uh, getting a shower, going through the, and it was a, gr a muddy road, so, you know, you're dirty when you're going up and you're dirty on your feet when you're getting back. And get back in bed, get to bed. And, of course, then you, once you, boom, you're gone. It just didn't take minutes because you know you're getting up pretty early the next day. And uh, so I went to bed, and you get a habit of listening with, uh, you know, your one ear is sort of a, it's something you don't realize, but I'm sleeping and uh, I hear the clink, clink, which it's been going on in, in freak, not every night, but quite frequently. And then the next thing I know, bam, big explosion. And, you know, I'm dust and, uh, and I look over, my first thing I looked over, I saw my fan was down on the floor, off. I said, oh, man. You know, and uh, the door frame right next, I, my, here's the hooch. Sits in this way. Mm -hmm. my, my bunk is, and my foot locker is right next to the sidewall and abuts the door to the, the frame. And I'm over here a little ways. And there's a, there's the McMurdy's uh, area, which is boarded, and he's got he's got a sandbags on top, and it's pretty pretty secure area. And then you got a little common room there with a fridge, and then you got a the interrogating uh, uh, El Ferry was Captain El Ferry was in interrogation there. And then you had the CI guy over here, and the the uh, imagery interpret people Im imagery interpretation people lived in a, had a special area just down the road and above that was the the orderly room a small enclosure so I'm looking in the dust there's everything and uh, I see pieces of wood over here and uh, I get out like this I you know the the collapse of my my mosquito net the metal frame just collapsed got out and I step down with my right foot for because uh, I'm turning like this so I step my right foot down and I stepped on a, actually stepped on a piece of wood with a nail and went right to the bottom. Yes, it hurts. And uh, and I'm and I, of course I pull it out. And uh, the look down to my left and here's Captain O'Ferry. He had been he heard the first click, so he stepped out of his little cubicle, which is just plywood. And it happened to be looking back when the explosion took place and a piece of wood with with nails, a thin piece with three nails, came whoosh, right by its face and scraped along and embedded itself in a, a plywood uh, partition that was mm -hmm. between the orderly room and us. And he, he went bonkers on that. I mean, they took him away. Uh, so I'm there, and the MPs come around, you know, and they're trying to uh, uh, talk. They talked. I talked to me, and... Uh, and uh, they asked me, and I said, what? I said, well, if it's a grenade. Well, you know, uh, grenades don't have fingerprints on you. And I said, and, and, and I, oh, no. So they just want to wash this out. Mm -hmm. they, they never bothered. Uh, nobody asked real pertinent questions. Do you think May done it? Because uh, you know, they, they used to have these things all out. You know. Did anybody get seriously hurt? No, because it only was directed at the boss was in the bunker, mm -hmm. literally. Myself, uh, El Furry, and El Furry got the nail screen, mm -hmm. but right. this just, he just cracked up right there. And then Loomis, Captain Loomis, he, he didn't seem to be phased at all. But you guys weren't the targets. We talking. weren't the targets, McMurdy was. Mm -hmm. But then McMurdy in his reacted. He had gar a guard. We had, we started guard duty, and he put a guard on top of the uh, 
the bunker, mm -hmm. right there was a, it's a big bunker right behind the hooch. And he also had patrolling, they had the CI people patrolling around the company area to see if they could get in. Nobody bothered to officially talk to anyone and try to get statements to who the, what their feelings were, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to try to maybe have a, a clue of one of who may have done this. It was just, and they, and they put, of course, putting the troops now also on guard duty after work on a bunker. Mm -hmm. I mean, that didn't go over very well either, but that, that was what happened with that, the incident. Okay. Now, did you have an idea of who was responsible oh, for yeah. the soldiers now? He worked for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Conti and a couple others mentioned the, that the, I was talking with uh, Mike there. Uh, I had a guy, I never remember, I, don't ask me to remember names. I only remember Conti's name and mm -hmm. Briston's name and Sergeant, uh, I, but I can't, and that Lieutenant, I can remember a lot of names. Not everyone. Yeah. Uh, the red-haired kid, it was a transfer from the aviation battalion. He was an intel type, trained, mm -hmm. from the aviation battalion, one of the groups. Now, that, that, w that little flags went off in my head here on this one. Why, you don't transfer a person in con t from, from one unit to another one unless you have a problem with them, mm -hmm. especially when you, in most cases, you are not full strength anyway. I mean, there's, this is a problem with the rotational policies and all mm -hmm. that. So there's, there's red flags going on. Uh, I knew, uh, nobody listened really. The kid, the kid with the red hair. That's all I remember. Uh, and so what, what kind of characteristics did he uh, show or what? Well, he, different? he, well, we knew he was, uh, I mean, from, I can't, they don't want, I, don't, I never went down into the troop area to go sit in their club. And I, I had a lieutenant who did that thing that's the same one I mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and you just didn't do it because you got to understand they, these kids put up with their all kinds of frustrations and they don't want their officers and their leaders around with them when they can just get off, you know, steam. Mm -hmm. uh, what it, it preceded this incident, uh, which I found out subsequently, was that the crazy guy, the crazy kid, had pulled his 45 on one of my troops, Condi specifically, and it's fortunately, others knew about his characteristics, which I never found out who they were and how come they did this, how come they knew this, but they had taken the magazine out of his, you had to put your, hang your guns on the, on the it was like uh, like the old west, hang yeah, the guns on. Check your on. guns at the saloon door, yeah. Yeah, and they had the gun rack a place you just put your belt, pistol belt or whatever, and you sling for your M16. Had taken the magazine out, of, this kid had, didn't take the magazine out or clear mm -hmm. the, someone had done that. Uh, and he was in the bar getting drunk. And it was a small club. But p in the close areas, people get on each other's nerves too, especially if they're tired man. And they said, he, he came up to Connie and tried to pull the trigger on him and of course, it won't pull the trigger because it doesn't have anything mm -hmm. in there, and there's no no ammunition in it. So he was a suspect right away, and but nobody ever did anything about it. Yeah. And then he just stay in, in the unit and continue. And on? he left eventually. Okay. The rotation they just kept mm -hmm. rotating. All right. Now, um, over the course of the, the time when you you have this particular assignment, um, did the sort of pattern of, of, of the war itself shift? Did the action stay at the same intensity level? Mostly. Uh, the only lapse was just before, uh, uh, brief lapse, maybe around December that I recall, but then after the first of the year, we started moving into, into Tain In more. Oh, see, we went into the, we went on a, we conducted operations all across the area. We went mm -hmm. against Kamal liaison routes, and that was a study that one of, that one of my kids, uh, Pauli was his name, who, who did the study, mm -hmm. and he thought he was going to give it to me and have me uh, brief the old man, General Casey, at this time, uh, and, and he's wrong because I'd worked it out. You know, I worked, talk, when I talk, took this over, I said, I want, I want people who do the job tell people about the job themselves because they did all the nitty-gritty mm -hmm. detailed things. 
And so he gave the uh, he gave the briefing, and then we sent a battalion in there, and and we had infiltration going on through almost all all November and and uh, going north and south. And after the first of the year, we moved into Tainin and set up Kamale set up uh, 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 operations to interdict again Kamalezan mm -hmm. in that area going from across from Cambodia into the south southern Vietnam in R region four and that was I mean a lot of things going on now did your people go into Cambodia or did you yes mm -hmm. not 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 the troops that work in the building here right. uh, I went with John this friend lives up north mm -hmm. we went in uh, uh, while we were uh, getting ready for the Cambodian uh, operation, we had visited uh, fire support bases. We went into Tainan Province and uh, and went to Khartoum uh, Special Forces Camp, which mm -hmm. is close to the border. And uh, that was interesting. I wouldn't have remembered that except for the fact that John and I went there, and uh, John <laughs> walked into the minefield. <laughs> they had a minefield. Yeah. He well, you, the signs were small signs, mm -hmm. and and there's a, there was a path, and he just kept walking like straight towards the. Went, hey, John, come back. Uh, and uh, in fact, interesting. Uh, talk about a small world here. There's a guy who works out at at Costco now, who got out of the army, but then was a lieutenant in the special forces. Dale was his first name. Works at Costco. And he was in that camp at that time that I was there. Now, I don't remember him because we never really mm -hmm. met. We went there and get, you know, get the, the briefings. Right. Usually you have a captain, a lieutenant, some other lieutenant, uh, the teams. I never got a chance to really say, you don't remember because you're moving on. But we had a lot of activity, a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. I went into Cambodia. Did you go in at a time when the, the large operation was going on? Yeah, when it was still on. Yeah. Uh, uh, we got a, in June, I think it was 6 June. We got out of there in the end of June. Uh, there was we. Uh, I got woke up earlier than normal. Uh, the G2 wants to go to Cambodia. There's been a, 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 a sapper attack on the uh, Camp David, they called it, which was on a two, three quarter border area in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got in the helicopter, John and I, John went with me. Uh, he was the plans officer, like I said. We got in a helicopter, and it was soup. So we and you're going up into the into the foothills of the anim, of the mountain range. So instead of clearing up, it gets thicker. But the helicopter was an instrument flight rule, so uh, he was able to go. And so we get over Cambodia, and it's thick. You can't see squat. You get there, and he all of a sudden he's starting. Clo you know circles. Mm -hmm. And all of, and you break through and you see ground and you're no more than say a hundred and some feet above. And uh, we go get off. It's like we came like this and we had to go to the left over here. We parked the helicopter and went through the gate. They had a barbed wire actually. That I call it a gate. And uh, he meets this colonel. His name was Anderson. Uh, colonel Conrad was the G2 at that time. And uh, he eventually became lieutenant general. But anyway, Mike Conrad was his name. Uh, he went and talked with his buddy. Anderson was his buddy. And he said, I want you to find, count, you know, see if you can get any intelligence and count the number of casualties. So John and I started out from, like, from our left side and went along the perimeter, and there were... I don't think any of them got in, but we counted, physically counted, 28 bodies. They were sappers, mm -hmm. just loincloth, and right. they were painted. <laughs> and uh, they, it stuck out, this one incident stuck out when I was going over here. They had set out claymores around the camp, and they put the, what they call, gas barrels of food gas around there and they put 
they put them in front of the claymores, the barrels, and they put the in the barrels in the in the gas they put the uh, what do you call soapy type material, so soap, so that it that what happens when the explosion explosion takes place it goes through the gas and the soap sticks to the to the pellets from the claymore and just just sprays. I mean they burn toasts them and and. And they came up to this, were coming this way, and this one poor NVA guy had a harness with RPGs on them, the rocket propelled mm -hmm. grenades, when he got hit by the claymore, and it, his lower part of his torso was about there, and his upper part was over here. And he was just, and the waistline was like this, where he had uh, physically got, cr it didn't go, crimped. Mm -hmm. uh, found some documents. Uh, e with a E6 or something like that. They were infiltration. Mm -hmm. And looking at firearms, uh, standard RPGs and AKs, but come around to the front of the entrance, the, by the entrance, there was a machine, 50 caliber. The kid was manning a 50 caliber, and they come up that way too, and he boom, 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 boom. And he got a, uh, a Vietnamese, a North Vietnamese officer had a, a, a Ruger, a Luger type pistol, mm -hmm. I can't remember the nomenclature now. Uh, and boy, that was pretty too. And I tried to con him out of that. Uh, you know, this is, a com you know, confiscation, mm -hmm. the booty, you know, from it was weapons we get to take and study these things, you know. I, I don't remember the line I gave him. He wasn't buying that. Mm -hmm. This was his gun. He killed that guy. Yep. He's keeping it. And uh, it was beautiful up there on the um, highlands, highlands part of Colony, probably the beautiful grass. Of course, they, uh, we saw also as we were flying to the B-52 bombs had gone up there, and they just, and the fact that it was so recent, they must have done it during the night that there was no moisture in, them, in mm -hmm. the craters. They were just craters you know, where the bombs had exploded. Yeah, we went to Cambodia. That, and uh, only one injury on that thing, on that whole base camp among the Americans. That mm -hmm. was a, a Lieutenant Miller. Don't ask me his first name. Uh, Miller had been a helicopter pilot. His branch, basic branch, was MI, but he was doing a, a tour, a helicopter qualification, mm -hmm. a tour in helicopters. And he, as soon as this was over, he was going to be back and he'd be an MI officer. And... Uh, he had flown helicopters in Tainan province for the uh, lift, mm -hmm. you know, Hueys. And he had got what they call shot down 10 times. That was a, you get shot down 10 times, you're grounded. Uh, shut down, shot down means uh, you got, you got, uh, took ground air fire mm -hmm. and the rotor bridge and you had to right. set down and took a lot of air to ground and, you know, and get, had it level down. Never got hurt that way. Anyway, so he's assigned as an air liaison officer for the brigade, for that brigade that in charge of that base camp. Well, the guys on the south fired the RP gun. You see, this thing sat on top of a base camp on the top, so they, they, they infiltrated around the base of it, mm -hmm. see, and then they made their attack to the fence to the berm where the claymores were. Uh, he was, I don't know, standing outside while all this stuff was going on and how it happened, but a claymore exploded near him and he got in his head. Fragmentation. Right. So they medevaced him out and never heard whatever happened to him. I mean, they don't tell you these things because he used to liaison with me mm -hmm. as in his, when we were down in the Fouk Vin, from the brigade uh, intelligence topics, because that was his specialty, mm -hmm. and I we'd brief him and maybe give him give him stuff to take back to whatever brigade uh, battalion of his unit was working, and give him enemy order battle stuff or overlays or whatever. But that was tragic because he talks. Uh, we talked mm -hmm. a lot. Okay. Uh, now you mentioned a few times talking about getting you know kept getting you know documents or things to translate. I mean, how common was that to find actual documents, and where do they come from? Well, I'm talking history here. Mm -hmm. First, the first tour, 
Very few. 66 or so. Mm -hmm. But as, as we had more contact with the enemy on the ground, and it more successful contact, mm -hmm. you start getting more documents and more. The CAV got a lot of prisoners, especially in, with the Cambodia operation. We had mm -hmm. so many people, it's hard to handle them all. But they kept you getting more and more. So by, by the time 70 was along, I was getting stacks of these translations of summaries from these things. But what kind of material were you capturing? I mean, what sort of uh, more, were they were would, like, for example, uh, you, you say you, uh, uh, one of the most valuable members uh, of, of a unit was the personnel officer, so to speak, the guy adjutant who keeps mm -hmm. the record of who's, a, who's there, what's he getting paid, and, you know, name, rank, serial numbers, that sort of thing. Well, you kill one of these guys because their adjutant goes with him on the operations. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sit back in the base. He's a, shoot, he's a fighter, too. Well, you get him, and he's got this thing in a book in his pack. Well, those things are valuable. They tell, name, they tell you the unit and his name and maybe what he does. Mm -hmm. uh, or you get the, an officer, and he's got a map that they shows where they were going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and you hit a base camp, one of their base camps, and they, they, they fled before they could get rid of things. And then you find all the document, they pay, handwritten stuff. Most of it's handwritten. Of course, there was propaganda mm -hmm. they put out. Uh, by the, uh, but that was typed out, but most of the stuff was handwritten diaries and things like that, or physical unit rosters. And, and are you getting more of this as you deal with more of the North Vietnamese regular Oh, forces? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the VC, they live in the communities, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yeah, you don't need the same kind of written records for, for that sort of but thing. But see, the, 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 I, had a, I had one of my analysts, his name's Weird Harold, they called him. He was the division... He handled NVA divisions, all the divisions, which in my, our estimation by 70, 69, 70, were all NVA. They, they, mm -hmm. they carried VC, uh, fifth and the ninth was supposedly VC. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. By after Tet is 68, yeah. they're gone. They're all NVA. I mean, the uniforms, the whole works. And uh, those, those type documents gives the analyst, the, the division analyst, an idea who, what units there are, how, what the strengths are, and who the commanders are, and you find a lot of documents you, which help you fill out that, that structure. Uh, and one thing as time went on, we got more, we were finding out a lot of things. One, that they more and more would form com task for what I call a task force. In other words, you don't decimate one whole battalion at one time. You form a task force mm -hmm. with made up of company from this and a company from that and a company from that. So you still have integral regiments and mm -hmm. battalions. And, but you'd get all kinds of documents and prisoners. Say, What's going on here? That we didn't hit, we hit a whole regiment? No, you hit a battalion or you hit a company or whatever. Mm -hmm because they were running, they didn't want to decimate the combat effectiveness of all the units at one time. Also, uh, as the war went on, especially, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Cambodian took place, but that uh, they were cutting back on automatic weapons, for example. They issued more, returned to issuing SKSs, you know, the semi-automatic mm -hmm. weapons. The AK-47 was all... And it goes in, like our M16 mm -hmm. originally, and, and soldiers have, a, have the habit of just burning up all their basic right. issue just like that. So they were having ammunition supply problems because we were interdicting everything. But by 70, one time frame, the things, uh, 70, I mean, they, things were getting grim for them. And that's probably the reason why they didn't have a, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, there was a sort of a lull in the action until 72. And uh, so on some level, you had some indication that at least some of what you were doing was working. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I could say we went to Cambodia. We, I mean, we found the mountain full of, they, they brought the stuff up. I got slides of this mm -hmm. stuff, some of this stuff. I mean, there's more than you could. Um, I backloaded thousands of rifles and machine guns and ammunition that the uh, out of this, what they call the out, one of it was called the mountain. Mm -hmm. It's just a big whole ammo dump up there in Cambodia, and uh, and we, 
basically, we, we, we had a good idea who's where and what's happened. And they, their combat effectiveness, we were not afraid of them. CAV wasn't afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the body counts were up. I, I, basically, documents and prisoners were the best thing. Uh, I showed the body count. That tells you you kill people. But the prisoners and that tell you what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Joe Sixpack, who's not, who doesn't know anything, that's another thing. And the, those armies, very, the ordinary soldier doesn't know that much. But he can tell you something, like his squad leader, so and so. Maybe mm -hmm. you get this, or a, a squad leader tells you, well, his boss is lieutenant so and so, and then it just goes up the chain of command. Or if you get a guy that's decided he's tired of getting shot at all the time, every time he moves into, by helicopter, by gunships, whatever thing, uh, he, he, he tells you, comes in, this is what we do, and this is what we're going to do, and, and that's what happened in 19. Uh, 69, that big offensive in starting in uh, September for us, but they were ambushing also along uh, uh, in the area a lot, and a lot of the activity. But anyway, this Lieutenant Recon guy came in and told us, this is going to hit you, mm -hmm. uh, Anlock, and this is where we're coming from. Here are the kickoff, you know, what units are going to do this? Well, after a while, you build up this database, and you got, you got uh, some good stuff. Now, did you deal at all with the prisoners, or did other people do that? Well, we had the interrogators. Now, the, the, thing, the thing is, you've got to... MPs control prisoner, the, 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 uh, the prison camp for them, mm -hmm. or the containment area. Also, uh, you have to complete the interrogations quickly because you have a responsibility for them back. You can't be carrying a lot of prisoners. Mm -hmm. Right. And priority ones are to be identified quickly. Well, that's, that rule gets broken every once in a while because uh, I can remember the, in the division, you had what they called AO chief. The division headquarters camp was called AO chief. And the, the artillery commander is responsible for the defense of that whole perimeter. And uh, the battalions that, that come back and do uh, every six months of palace guards perform, we call them palace guards for six months, are under the control of the, 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 the AO chief guy. The, and he, they captured a, one time they captured a, this prisoner and, 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 and they, without basically informing anybody. They just use them as a point on the further operations to go back and, you know, they got to be, yeah, if for a prisoner to become, he's got to be a, he must de declare himself a, a, a refugee, sort mm -hmm. or Hoi Chan, we used to call him, is the person, Chu Hoi, he, he comes over to the good right, side, the right. light side of the force. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not to be used in combat operations. Uh, then you had an incident where they captured the guy who was who was listening to helicopter communications. Who was an uh, he was an Arvin communications intelligence specialist in south of uh, of Phuc Vinh. Uh, is a the river, the Binzung River, or I mean the what's it called, the Dong Nai. I'm sorry, Dong Nai River. And it, there's an area that comes like this. And, and he was down in this area, and he, he had just a simple radio, Jerry rig, where he was listening to FM communications off in helicopters. Well, this signals intelligence. Well, they got him back, and, they, and, and we're interrogating him. Problem was, as soon as it hit the wire that we had a signals intelligence a uh, guy, the National Security Agency, ASA, Signals Intelligence, mm -hmm. who have priority, and they, they just send people down and get him. I mean, they have priority. You're not supposed to do that. But this fellow had been in the South Vietnamese Army. Initially. No, he had been a, he had been a NVA. Oh, okay, because he was at Arvin, so I was... Oh, Arvin, I'm sorry. Okay. He had okay. been NVA, okay. and he was down there doing this. That means he's a combatant. Mm -hmm. But he signals intelligence, right. and when they get, you've got to report these people. 
and they didn't, even our SSO could have, Special Security Officer, which has signet, which could have just called up the chain, mm -hmm. uh, but he, they didn't, they kept it to themselves because this guy was giving good stuff. Uh, they, they came down and picked him up, mm -hmm. a helicopter, but uh, they had, uh, during the Cambodian operation, we had more people to debrief, basic, interrogate, uh, debriefing is for willing mm -hmm. sources, interrogations for right. unwilling. Uh, it was, it was a, I mean, being swamped. There were so many when they went up to Cambodia, all these people coming down from, uh, from out of Cambodia and, and the like, uh, it was uh, busy, mm -hmm. and a lot of good information. Uh, a little bit different kind of question. You mentioned a little bit. What was sort of the uh, life like on the base for, for the ordinary soldiers? I mean, to what extent? I mean, how many of them have girlfriends living in and that kind of thing? Or nothing. In they no no. Well, in the in the base camp, except for my. There were. U.S.O. or Special Services women. Mm -hmm. uh, they go under. I can't, I don't know if you want to list the names. They, you probably heard the names they call these people. Uh, they had names, donut dollies, pastry pigs, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, who, who had a, who were on the division headquarters base camp, who had run pool tables, they had the little, mm -hmm. troops could come in and get Cokes and coffee and that stuff. But they didn't date the ordinary soldiers. Mm -hmm. They were, they, they <laughs> seemed the, the these, these, uh, these uh, <laughs> helicopter pilots, warrant officers, these young kids who go to uh, helicopter school and at 19 they're a helicopter pilot and they, they, they're super cool, you know, you know like mm -hmm. you see kids now, so like it remind me in high school of the studs. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would always date the pastry pigs or whatever you want to call them. Now, were those American women or Vietnamese? Yeah, American women. Okay. There were no, uh, the only one Vietnamese woman I knew on our post was the one that my, my uh, the, uh, a detachment first sergeant was okay. living. So with. that was an unusual situation. That was unusual. That, okay. You're not supposed to have them in a in a tactical zone on base camp. No way. Okay. But did you have Vietnamese who would work on the on the base during the day no. and come out? No, no. That, uh, didn't go on for no, your area. Didn't there. go on. Okay. No, no. Um, in general, uh, how would you characterize morale and discipline on the base while you were there? Well, this is morale is a relative term in the sense that each unit has to determine their own morale. There's no, you can't say this condition, mm -hmm. everybody has the same thing. Most of the time, the morale in our, in my section was good, except for that little bit mm -hmm. with Major McMurdy. In fact, I got four, four or five, five kids that extended after their tour was over because they didn't want to go back to the States. Mm -hmm. They were happy with their jobs. And they didn't. They they didn't mind. Uh, yet you go into the palace guards. Palace guards were rotating every six months. Well, why were they unhappy troopers? They took them out of the field and they stick them in there, and they're doing housekeeping tours. Mm -hmm. Caused a lot of moral mor uh, 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 morale problems. Mm -hmm. And they were they were shooting their sergeants and the officers. Good example. Uh, I was, I got, we, I was a junior officer, so I, that time, cause I, I had coffee and we had dinner in the mess mm -hmm. for the, uh, with the junior officers. And then one of them was a lieutenant who was with the headquarters company. Now the headquarters company was so bad because they had the, they were responsible for palace guard. Uh, the, the officers and NCOs didn't sleep in the company area. They, they moved them around so that troops couldn't find them. And the lieutenant was, wor was really glad to get out of there when they sent him up to, to a uh, ASP, ammunition supply point, up there near the Cambodian border uh, when they were conducting operations before the, before the uh, uh, Cambodian thing. Mm -hmm. They were com near the Cambodian border up there. He was the am a ammunition supply point. He didn't get hurt while he was there, but he got got hurt up there on that on that particular ammunition. Where they fired rockets into mm -hmm. it, and he got wounded. And I think I f run into him later on 
and one of the conventions, mm -hmm. and I can't remember. I think it was a recent one. I just happened to run but, into But it. he was happy to get out of the palace. Oh, garden. happy. I mean, there was, there was sh uh, every night there was brrr or boom, you know, where there's somebody threw a grenade in somebody's hooch. Because they're squirrely. Troops coming out of combat are mm -hmm. squirrely. Uh, uh, combat affects people differently. And, uh, and I think my experience, and I, I know in this CAV, my CAV unit, I, the chapter, we've got several people who've gone through PTSD therapy, mm -hmm. uh, who, who had problems. And, you know, it just, you don't know on face, uh, by just looking at somebody, how he's going to react to that stress. If you've never been under stress before, you may have, well, they're finding it with this kid. Even though they're good kids, they're all volunteers, they're going in there. Afghanistan, you're getting a bunch of them that have come out with stress problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't know what they're going to do under stress. Uh, and there's not really anything being done at that stage. They come back from the field, they're assigned to palace guards. No one is, is looking after them or checking them out or anything else. No, they're just doing jobs. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know, on the base camp of the division, how much drug trafficking or mm -hmm. drugs there were available. It was a little more difficult to get them there because and they couldn't go out into the vill, the mm -hmm. village. The gate was closed. Okay. But helicopter pilots can fly around and troops can the field. But I don't know if that, that, I do know when I was up in the two corps job, there were drugs involved mm -hmm. and I saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, and could you observe any, any racial issues? Uh, not, not specifically, no. Uh, that subsequently to Vietnam when I was in, in my follow on tour, mm -hmm. my my last tour after the two, nine, uh, uh, 71, 72, definitely in Germany. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. All right. Um, now, are there other kind of significant aspects of, of that, that sort of tour that you haven't gotten really into yet? You've talked kind of about some of the kinds of duties you were performing and what was going on. Um, and the Cambodian incursion was one kind of major event going on during that time that your division was involved in. Uh, were there other particular things that kind of stand out? Not really, because we, like I said, it was six, old dark 30 in the morning, old dark 30 at night. Uh, you were, you fly around. Mm -hmm. Of course, I still had administrative duties. Mm -hmm. You know, Troops would rotate, they start rotating, and I got to put, you know, they form, we get a form come in, and I got to put them in for air metal or whatever metal. Uh, you get uh, one kid who'd like, uh, this kid who I told you was reading Sergeant Rock comic mm -hmm. books, name, last name was, his name was Barney. I can't remember the last name. Barney was a little slow mm -hmm. on the uptake. Uh, how he got through intelligence school, I don't know. But anyway, he was school trained. The ones where I got the augmentation, only one was intelligence trained. The other mm -hmm. one were infantry guys, most of them. Uh, I, he didn't like the job I gave him because he wanted to be a soldier. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't have the brains to do I mean, he wasn't very, he couldn't pick up on things, not an analytical mind, nothing wrong with him. I mean, personally, well, he just didn't have the mind. So I gave him a job that I thought he was comprehend and the sergeant thought he could do it. He didn't want to do it. So he volunteered to go to, want to become a ranger. Mm -hmm. They were taking kids in country. But to get, I, uh, he had to go through a, a one week course put on by the ranger company. Well, I knew the ranger company. I, I mean, commander and the first sergeant, because rangers formed up in the teams that were, were deployed out in the, out in the jungles. Mm -hmm. And they were getting tasking uh, intel collection tasking and stuff from uh, G2 and, and, and I, so I got to know him. Right. And so he, I, I, when Barney wants to, I couldn't stop him from going by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, if he wanted it, I, had, I, I could, he, he, he has to submit paperwork and I could say, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't think he's going to make it. Uh, it's not my judgment. So he went I finally, uh, I, I, I couldn't put the line, uh, 
uh, approval pr provided suitable replacement. <laughs> I mm -hmm. couldn't use that line, which is common in the pre-war period, and that's how they they screw over somebody by not letting them re oh, re risk. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so he goes, and uh, I, I before he went, I walked over to because I knew ca the captain uh, who was in charge of he event. I haven't seen him subsequently, only once. And Stame's name starts with a P. I know a lot of the rangers that were in there at the time. I see him at convention. But anyway, go over there and I talk. I said, I don't want any, him getting special privileges on this, on this. You know, you know me. Do put, put him through the same th routine you put to anybody else that applies for this. Well, he goes over there in two days, he's back. And Barney then says, well, I, I want to be a helicopter door gunner. So he submits again, and I have to sign, and he goes. And within a month, he got killed. Mm -hmm. Door gunners were the first thing the envy people shoot at. You know, that's a dangerous job. Uh, not, not a lot of job security in that. Okay. Now, during that uh, year there, did you get any leave time or R&R &R or go anywhere? I went R&R. &R. Now, you're going to have to ask me... <laughs> I can't remember which one I went to, because during my my time, I had been to the first tour. I went to Japan. In the second tour, I went to Australia. And then uh, I, I got two R and Rs during the cab because I was mm -hmm. six months, six months. That's mm -hmm. the way they did it. Yeah, I went to. I think, if I recall, Taipei and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And in the last tour, which we'll talk about, I went to, the only thing open then was Hong Kong, so I went twice there. Okay. Um, what do you do when you go to Taipei or to Hong Kong? Well, during uh, the, it was still the Nationalist Party running the place. Uh, uh, I went to Taroko Gorge, just a south, beautiful scenic area. Uh, I go in the, you get off the plane and you, you got the pimps are practically on, on the bus with you. Uh, in fact, uh, when you got into the special services, it was run by the R&R &R Center, you got the pimp comes right in the, right in the uh, hotel. Yeah. <laughs> and he can't show you his wares. And I said, no, I don't want any of this stuff. And they, they take you across the street and... That's fooey. Uh, but shock, that's a cultural shock. Mm -hmm. yes. But food, I went to, uh, 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 in a big, big, big building, a com combination department store type structure in Taipei, uh, uh, Mongolian cookout type restaurant, which I thought was real, the first time I'd been introduced to that, a lot of fun. Uh, toured those, like I said, we went up to the presidential palace and. The guards on there were were not too happy that we were taking pictures uh, because it then still I don't know who was in charge. It wasn't. I mean, it could have been Chiang Kai Shek. He was still there. Yeah. Uh, what was Hong Kong like to visit? I stayed at a, a a big hotel. It was fantastic. In fact, I shared a room with a Marine officer. Uh, <laughs> it's fuck. His brother was in been with them, came in with, but they married officers with officers. Mm -hmm. And his brother went out, went down and just lost his, you know what, and would spend all his money spending the whole seven days in bed. Should mm -hmm. I, that, uh, beautiful, uh, the, uh, arc, you know, s just touring the city, that mm -hmm. trip on a, pon on a, on a catamaran mm -hmm. out to the island, the temples and, uh, just walking around and eating, and uh, and uh, the hotel was just fantastic. And not being shot at. And not being shot at, and getting clean water, showers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, you know, uh, like when I went to Australia, the second tour, I had a permanent black thing in my my skin from the fact that we never got hot water, could get clean. Even if you took a shower, you never got fully clean. And to go to some place where there isn't filth around and dirt and dust, to be able to uh, 
to get a clean shower was just great and to eat food that didn't make you sick. That's, that, the, 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 the Australian one, Australia is a beautiful, oh, Sydney, gorgeous. I, I was there the, the, when they were building the new, the thing they the show, Opera House. Opera yeah. House. They got a, we had a tour, a tour with the, whoever, the guide, mm -hmm. showing us where's, with this going there and that. On the harbor, we took a tour on the boat on the harbor too. Uh, incidentally, you don't s swim in the harbor except <laughs> behind there's shark screens, by the way, because you think there are no sharks. Look at those, those screens there, there's dead sharks on the screen. So their sharks are whites. Uh, I had a chance to marry up with a, they, they try to have you meet an Australian family. Mm -hmm. That was the, probably the best one of all my r and by the way. And I said, yeah, I like one. Well, how about a, a barrister? Well, it's a lawyer. And I don't, I believe he's a barrister. Could have been a counselor. Mm -hmm. A counselor's a, like our regular lawyer. Barristers goes before the bar, right. goes to the courts. Right. And uh, I was, to, I used to be there at 6 o'clock. I got directions. They signed me up. He mm -hmm. located. So I show up. Uh, and unbeknown, I thought, well, we're going to have supper right away. Unbeknownst to me, they don't eat till about 8 o'clock. And also, unbeknownst to me, they like to drink before they eat. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm walking around all day long. I had breakfast, and I don't know if I had lunch or not, but I come in there, and I figure, okay, I have a small. And he comes with these huge... You know, pints are bigger. Bigger, yeah. pints are bigger of this dark beer. Mm -hmm. And I drank it, but... By the time supper, 8 o'clock, oh, man, it was bad. But uh, again, Australia uh, is a beautiful town, gorgeous town. Taipei's nice. Hong Kong is great. Uh, Bangkok, Bangkok is also nice, but it's such a crowded, and traffic was so, you, you know, you go in taxi, but uh, I also took, while I was there, I took one of these, uh, I was there two times because that's the only thing I offer. Mm -hmm. One of these uh, boat, these little snake things are narrow boats they have, you know, that gazing through the water. Through the, through the canals. Yeah, stuff. I went up to the River Quay, you know, mm -hmm. with the, the movie. Right. I uh, went to the, uh, one of the, I went to the, temp, the temples with the, with the gold Buddha. They got a, a gold Buddha there that they found sometime in, in the 19th century that, weighs, I don't know how many tons, and just, they got that. And I, I got a lot of pictures. Uh, the most, one of the most <laughs> interesting incidents was they have a, a, a zoo there, a serpentarium they call it, with a lot of reptiles. So I'm walking down the, rep the zoo, and I want a sign that says, largest, world's largest sea crocodile. Ooh. So I walk down, I'm walking down, but I'm not paying attention to my left. There's some things there, boxes or whatever. And I walk back this one, and they, just as I walk by, this king cobra hits the plexiglass <laughs> right as I'm walking by. Oh, I'm mighty. I mean, I just about lost my lunch on that one. They are big. Mm -hmm. And... You know, they, they're actually in India, they cause more, more deaths than I think than many other things. But r and is a, a very interesting educational, mm -hmm. historical. You know, I'm a history buff, so I, I enjoy those things. So you were spending it somewhere other than just in bed, so you, you were picking up the Oh, yeah. Or, well, yeah. in that, that uh, Australian tour, I had a little, little uh, physical problem I had to deal with. Uh, during that tour, I was, had two things. Uh, in, uh, not just, sort of like, a, not quite amoebic dysentery, mm -hmm. but getting up to that point. Yeah. Keeping things in and keeping things out. I mean, of course, it didn't help that we had to take the malaria pills, mm -hmm. the orange, the deadly orange pill. Uh, but I was taking this uh, paragoric mixed with kaopectate from the do Navy doctor. Mm -hmm. 
And also, uh, I had a carbuckle too on this. So I got to Australia and I said, boy, clean English speaker, I'm, I'm in. And if I want to get a good meal. And I go down to the a restaurant on steak. So I get in a taxi and they take me to a restaurant and uh, ask for want to get a good steak. So I go in there and I start, I ate the steak and I think I got about halfway through. Mm. And it came right back again. But that was the, but I still liked Australia despite that. All right. Um, any other sort of aspects of that, the third tour there? That the third to tour, yeah. Uh, after, after the cam everything was anticlimactic after we came back from, uh, I mean, they were trying to make work. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a new G2. Conrad had left and we got C Colonel Kasarian, who was, I'm a colonel, you're a captain, mm -hmm. don't talk to me. Fine. Uh, and I had to talk to him. I, I, fig I figured, you know, I normally didn't talk to Colonel Conrad or C Colonel Hannes or Colonel Galvin. Colonel Galvin made USURA commander or NATO commander. Mm -hmm. uh, Conrad made deputy IG of the Army. Uh, 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 Hannes taught at West Point when he got back because he got hurt, but mm -hmm. I can remember all these other ones. Barrett retired as a commander and also took the unit where I belonged to, the, the ancestor of the unit I belonged to when I was working as a civilian mm -hmm. at, at, at uh, Fort Meade. Well, anyway, I couldn't, he didn't want, I, I'd like to brief him on what, what we're doing, mm -hmm. but Can Hannes was like, uh, well, I'm the colonel. Okay, fine, I'm going to talk to him. And, and he, he, he didn't like to be confronted like that. And I was g counseled by uh, Mulder, who was, had been the uh, company commander after Rick Murdy got, mm -hmm. went up to bigger. I, I remember chief of, st chief of staff was Meyer, who eventually became chief of staff of the Army. He comes down and gets one of the, well, we're sir, moving them up to bigger and better mm -hmm. things. And Well, anyway. Uh, Motor says you better just back off on Kasarian because he's he doesn't want to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you're too low on the totem pole. Okay, fine. And so I watched. <laughs> what happened? It's this. This is sort of hilarious. Uh, just for this brief time, this this month period. He went, took the, he, he shared a helicopter with a G3. G3, G2, G3 operations. Mm -hmm. Probably the most important man in the talk. Right. G2 is not. Takes the helicopter and he's gone. Well, Colonel Stolzer come in one day to the talk and I'm there. And he's up at the, uh, the they had a U-shaped device where G2 over here, G3 over mm -hmm. here. Anybody know where Colonel Kosarian is? Uh, I need the helicopter. Well, his, his desk sergeant there, this buck sergeant, knew where he was. But he asked the question, do you, do you know where... Uh, do, uh, did he tell you where he was going? Mm -hmm. And he'd been screwing over this young soldier. I learned this. You don't screw over the... I mean, you don't do that. And the guy said, no, he didn't tell me, sir. Well, he knew where it was. When, well, Kutserian grounded him. He could never use the G23 again. So he had to go get to the... go up to the uh, division headquarters and get, get the chief of staff... Uh, clerk who controlled the, the division, the, the helicopter platoon which supported division staff. And I learned that out quick. You know, you, you got to, I used to have to go brief the general, Casey, in particular, because Casey became the division commander. He was an 
assistant division commander before mm -hmm. he took over. I'd sit out there while an operation with, they, with the, something's going on before I go in. And there was a kid that sat there controlled the helicopter. His name was Golden, G-O-L-D-N. And I, I just struck up conversation. I said, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm a captain, you're a lowly mm -hmm. thing. And I never worked that way. I, I figure a person will know and I'm naturally and I'm not going to force my issue. And he would, kid just wants somebody to talk to, he taught me. I just listen. That's good. Just listen. Because they have frustrations mm -hmm. too. And I listened to him. And, uh, hell, I could get a hel helicopter any time I wanted. Mm -hmm. He'd range it. I go to, have to go to Tain Inn. I have to go to, to one of the other brigades or wherever. Just, hey, I come up there. You got, can you, I got to get, you know, fine. I just got one maybe in 15 minutes. It's set. Anyway, uh, <laughs> got grounded. So he had to go to the, get another ride. Well, one time he went and, this, I, he, he got a Loach. Loach is a small helicopter, mm -hmm. light observation right. helicopter, OH-6 Alpha. And, and it, what, it wasn't a liaison. The, 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 the normal liaison helicopter is non-armed. This was armed, so I, I think he got it from a, it was a, one of the recon helicopters mm -hmm. from, the, from a, the first and the ninth or one of the units right there at the camp. But anyway. He is a short guy. He's stepping onto the helicopter. Now I'm 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 left-handed, so I'll probably sit my left first. He he's right-handed, so he's going in like this on this side, and he reaches up. He's stepping on the rail. You know, when the mm -hmm. thing sits down, you know what they look like, the skids. Right. And he grabs the handle of the. There's a machine gun here, minigun. Mm -hmm. or, no, it was a standard M60. Okay. Grabs this thing to pull, him, pull himself up. Guess what he does? Hits the trigger and <laughs> shot to the end of his foot. There's justice. Right. For, you, you be a... You mentioned uh, you, know, you could get a helicopter when you wanted. Did you spend a lot of time going back and forth to visit different... Uh, as much as I, they the let field? me go, yeah. I went on a reconnaissance mission once mm -hmm. with them because I made a, you know, one thing I liked about the cab, you didn't have to pretend that you're perfect because nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. You could be yourself. You, you could give your all to the job, but you're going to make mistakes mm -hmm. as long as you don't make mistakes that kill people, you know. Uh, you can blow it. Well, and, you're per and you have a, I, I said, one day I'm going to talk. And I'm talking to, I'm talking to, I think it's uh, Colonel, Colonel uh, Conrad is the G2. And he was a friend of, of, of one of the other, uh, I think it was uh, Bob, he's de Treadway now, he's dead, he died just a couple of years ago, it surprised me too, I, I used him at convention. He was the air liaison uh, to the, to the first and ninth, which mm -hmm. which we dealt with quite a bit. Anyway, I said, "How the hell can these helicopter pilots see that there were six VC walking down the trail over here? I mean, they're flying by. How mm -hmm. do they? It's just as bad as the Air Force saying they mm -hmm. they killed ten bodies by their bombs. You know, like KBA or whatever, mm -hmm. or KIA by air. Right? How the hell can they see this?" And I, my colonel says, uh, I didn't know this. He, I, I deducting lady that he talked to the to Bob, and Bob arranged for me to go on a recon mission mm -hmm. with a, with a pink team. A pink team, by definition, is the little bird. And, with with cobra coverage, mm -hmm. snakes we call them. Two normally, or one, but two. So they say, Ron, you got to go down, get your, get your, get your, get a weapon, and go down mm -hmm. to, to the uh, first night, and we're going. Okay. Could have been. That was first night. It was a. <laughs> this is funny. 
So I'm, I'm in the left seat of the helicopter. The pilot's here. I'm left-handed. Got, I've got an M16. Mm -hmm. I'm left-handed, by the way. I shoot like this. I don't shoot like that. Out the window. And I'm got a flak vest on. So we're, we're going along, and we fly south into that war zone D I mentioned previously. And we're, the snakes are above us. They're, they're following us along. And all of, we're going, it's like a bzzz, And all of a sudden, we go down like this. And, they're, and next thing you know, we're going below the tree line. Well, immediately, it dawned on me how they can see this because they're, they're going, they can see, they're no longer than, say, maybe 10 feet above the ground. So if there's any footprints in the dirt, mm -hmm. they're going to see them. Well, we're flying, we're, in the meantime, we're flying along this trail, like, and, the, and we're sort of hovering a little bit, and the, and the guy back in the, the door gunner slash mechanic or whatever his crew, chief, crew member mm -hmm. is, is putting explosives in and old ammunition cans and putting in a, pulling a grenade and sticking, throwing it down in the hole. Oh, we're, we're going to, the, we move up and we're going to, and, and he's talking to me on the headphones, this, the helicopter pilot. And, uh, and he, we're talking and he's not really paying, he's lost his concentration a bit because he knows subconsciously that what that guy's doing in the back there with these in that you only have four seconds before that grenade goes off mm -hmm. so all of a sudden the guy said oh shit boom and the, the explosion literally pushed the helicopter forward mm -hmm. so i learned okay shut up don't say anything anymore <laughs> uh do you want remember well, well, I mean, and I guess, uh, and then did you go, but you would visit units out in the field? Yes. And, and check in with them? On yes, I check. Uh, we'd go to Tainan. We went up to Khartoum, like I say, we've, which, uh, and uh, I've been to Liaison with the 25th Infantry Division, 20, uh, the 1st Infantry Division, like a, uh, coordinate uh, if we're going to, uh, any in intelligence things. Mm -hmm. uh, and also saw that we had a much better intel shop than either one of those units had because we were better organized in a sense that uh, we, there's a, they either put too much responsibility on some of these young people or they don't give them enough. There doesn't seem to be a uh, middle I figured ours was had a nice mix of senior supervision. I had uh, after they get Lieutenant Johnson uh, uh, rotated. Mm -hmm. I had a, another lieutenant come in named Rick Borders. We're still friends, by the way. He, he retired as a lieutenant colonel. was a was the uh, VA representative for the state of uh, Idaho. And uh, Mr. Pascalino, who was a warrant officer and uh, had been in intel but never been in a tactical unit like that before. And of course, Sergeant, Sergeant Hodge left finally. We got another NCO, but he was a good NCO mm -hmm. even though he liked to drink at lunch hour. But <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not being judgmental. But you had a pretty end. good mix of, of senior people who knew what they were doing. They were new, the new yeah. senior people who knew how to be leaders. Mm -hmm and who, who study what their subject is, not just sit back. Donnie Johnson, the one I got rid of it, his problem was he didn't try. And uh, I, I didn't have time to just set him on, take him under my mm -hmm. wing and say, right. Uh, he'd read uh, Westerns while, while he was sitting at his desk. And then he'd, uh, he'd come, I'd come to work in the morning and he's complaining because somebody's stealing his pens. Well, uh, since when is the U.S. Army ballpoint pen your pen? It belongs to everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 
I want you to char a court martial you know, with it. So, <laughs> you know, that was funny. But uh, it was when initially, I mean, we were talking to Mike here about this. How, how did they start out? I, first, I got this. I selected five people to give me the, in the cab. First came in the plan. I laid out the plan, come up with a plan, under, uh, talked to Hodge about it. We talked, what, what do you think a nice mix would be? Went to uh, the, briefed the, the G2 on it, and uh, he said, do it. And, uh, well, actually, Charlie Wilson told the boss mm -hmm. what we're going to do, and because I Barrett was getting short, and uh, in fact I didn't see him very much. But so Charlie Wilson was the transition guy. Right. I didn't get McMurdy. <laughs> McMurdy was was another CI officer promoted to lieutenant colonel in the job. Lasted about two three weeks at most. He it turns out there's a term called CAV standard. You hear it in the cab. He was not calf standard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what? He, what, I, what the the straw, straw that broke the camel's back. You know, you've heard that term, right? Mm -hmm. He he took he did the five o'clock briefing. Now why he did it? He has capable subordinates to do this briefing. The briefing's for the staff, mm -hmm. but he did the five o'clock. So he had. His briefing cards. He had briefing cards, which the follow-on officer was a captain from operations who was doing the briefing. He could have his assistant or an operations officer of some sort. He didn't have to do it. Well, anyway, he did it. And he's briefing. He's got the cards. And he's standing. Here's the briefer over here. He, now, I, he may be right-handed. I don't know. I think he was right-handed. So he's got the po a pointer. And he's reading, ah, such and such and such and such and such and such. And I'm standing over here on the, with, I was a lowly man, with uh, Charlie Wilson over here towards the entrance on this side. So I'm watching this, and he's, and the General Roberts is there. This is before Casey. Mm -hmm. Roberts, Chief of Staff is there. Ops, G oath, uh, the Ops Officer, the, the G3 is there. And He's reading his cards about enemy activity, and it, his pointers, he'd start at this location, blah, 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 and he's talking, his arm is going down like this. Well, on the board, you share the same board, but the G3 people put the locations of all the unit status on the board that are in operations where they are, this battalion's there and this battalion's there, they're doing this, mm -hmm. they're doing that, Company X is doing Y and all that. It's on that board, and they're the, the stickums. Well, what's this pointer doing? Click, plip, 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 plip. They're falling on the floor. <laughs> I looked at, looked at the, the face of the G3, and he is going. He's, you know, the steam is coming out of his face. And, and, uh, that's, I never knew what transpired afterwards, but Colonel Mc, Mc, uh, McCain, McCann, he was out of there. there. He's gone. Uh, <laughs> let's see who said, next came uh, Hannes, General Colonel Hannes. Hannes was, uh, <laughs> he was a cavalryman, you know what I mean by that? He was a soldier. Mm -hmm. Been in cavalry, not horses, but what we call cavalry tanks and mm -hmm. in the uh, air mobility. He was a straightforward. Don't don't mince words. Tell it like it is. And uh, one day, and also he, the general staff used to have me their supper meal together. Roberts like that, and we used to, us poor peons look at envy they're using plates mm -hmm. and dishes and they had wine on the table and <laughs> knives and forks and spoons you know and with envy and uh, so one day Hannes comes in 
comes into the G2, into my office, I mean. Comes after the dinner, he come into the back, and, and he has, uh, I can't remember who came, he sent somebody to go into my office, and of course I'm, fr I'm moving all the time, mm -hmm. and wants an overlay of all the infiltration quarters throughout our area of operational responsibility, which is a major project mm -hmm. by Friday. Okay. Well, that entailed taking, running, uh, uh, acetate comes in running, what they call running feet, which is a 39 inches, a, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 it's a meter, yeah. and it comes in big rolls. So that it takes that and getting this heavy duty tape and splicing sheets of this to get cover a whole wall. And they put, zip these, uh, little thin colored tapes, you know, you, and put them down the corridors, mm -hmm. various colors for various corridors and naming them. So the troops did that. They rolled it up, and I don't know who took it up, and they st stuck it back in the back of the G2's office, right behind his desk. And <laughs> so about Two and a half, three weeks later, the one said, sir, we need acetate. We're running out because we used to visit the brigades or battalions in the brigades and make overlays of that particular battalion's area of operation mm -hmm. with all the stuff on it, and it takes acetate, little wee chunks of it. Right. So I, I, he said, well, sir, we, we, maybe you can get that thing back because it's a lot of acetate we could use. So uh, one day I walked up, uh, I did that. I walked up that day and into the G2, and here's Hannah's behind on his desk. And I said, sir, uh, is, are you through with the, this overlay thing? Because we could sure use it, uh, we're, we're running short. And he says, I haven't been figured, what the F-bomb is that doing there? I don't even remember why that's there. Mm -hmm. Why is that there? Because, you know, there's a lot of activity. Well. I did want to say, sir, you asked for it. Mm -hmm. You were, well, he was tipsy. That They used to drink wine, mm -hmm. and they'd come back, and he'd, you know, this. So, <laughs> so the guy, uh, he was, he, in, in the second, uh, in 70, early 70, they were doing these, doing these combat operations in Tainan province in the war zone C area, famous area. And, and and we were doing, activity was really picking up. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember how far they were in. What, they were interdicting Kamalaya's and routes. That was the mission. They were running from Cambodia through the, what they call the elephant's ear, down into s the southern area, supplies. But the enemy, want, we put these bases there, and the enemy wanted to get them out of the way. Mm -hmm. So we were listening on the radio that night, and there's, they were talking to, from, from the battalion to the division, talking about enemy activity and the, that uh, you could smell the burning marijuana. They were drugging, they were taking drugs, you could smell them. And, uh, and they, st they fired uh, mortars, heavy mortars, 120s. And one of them, uh, it was hot. So Hannes was slaying on the top of the bunker, the, command, uh, the battalion command bunker, and the mortar round came and He lost leg, arm, survived. Uh, they charged the battle, the, the, the enemy charged, you know, Banzai sort of thing, mm -hmm. the uh, ba that uh, fire support base, mm -hmm. And a lot of them didn't have any guns. They just charged. They were too high on drugs. They used to drug soldiers. You know, NBA would be drugged to go out because, uh, you know, with that by the war, it's pretty getting pretty dicey. You know, they're getting helicopter. You could walk it on a trail and somebody in a helicopter would see them and fire them up, you know. Uh, but there was, the activity was high level. Mm -hmm. Of course, after they, back from Cambodia, they started doing studies. And uh, they brought the stuff back, the, a lot of the booty, not all of it, just, a, well, like the tip of the iceberg, actually, but we had the whole area in front of where the, where the, the uh, 
special services off, you know, where the troops went in, that whole area was all loaded with, with boxes of uh, AK-47s and Cosmoline mm -hmm. and pistols and all kinds of stuff. Uh, they took pictures of, you know, for, I took pictures of that stuff. It got me sitting on a, on the air defense weapon too mm -hmm. when I was, actually I was overweight at that time. I was bad shape, terrible shape. Yeah, I see pictures. I don't. I don't show them to anybody. They, they, I, all you do is sleep, ride a jeep up to your office, sit at your desk, walk maybe a little distance, go on the helicopter ride. There was no regular exercise. No exercise activity, programs. Yeah. None. At least the troops in the field tromped around all the time, and they got yeah, they'd sweat off a lot. Yeah, sweat yeah. off a lot. But I can't. I I remember a lot of things, but not. Okay. Uh, so you get to the end of, of that particular year's tour, uh, and then what are your options at that point? Well, that's, that's a good point. I have a, I end of that, end of that 70, that says in 70. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to the ter career, what they call the career course. The career course is the captain's, captain level course in some majors, but mostly captains, mm -hmm. for their cap company, co for for the it's how you train to be a company commander and you more in complicated intelligence type functions at Fort uh, Halliburton, nor, uh, 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 Baltimore. It's in Baltimore, Maryland. And and I spent time there, and to preclude preclude another assignment. In fact, I think they were cutting orders for me to go to Fort Bragg again. They they. They put out these little things, you get it from personnel, re, uh, they call them RFOs, requests for orders. As you see, uh, they use in the old days six ply paper, you know, where you get a six pieces of colored paper and they can type on it and uh, it goes through the, and they tear the thing off and then you, they send you a copy of it through the mail, usually around six months in advance. Well, when I got my at this career course, I got that thing. I, uh, they were going to go for assignments. I said, ah, uh, I'll go back to Vietnam and, and uh, let me go in the Phoenix program. Now why would you go to choose to go to Vietnam rather than Fort Bragg? Well, th I told you about Fort Bragg, right? I was a uh, headquarters and headquarters company commander then. Mm -hmm. We didn't discuss this at any length. I was, uh, I was signed for the battalion supply. Mm -hmm the motor pool, the mess hall, billeting for all the uh, soldiers mm -hmm. in the headquarters, and the headquarters company, headquarters and headquarters company was the largest number. We, uh, aerial reconnaissance battalion just has small detachments. They don't have, most of the support is in the headquarters and headquarters company. Mm -hmm. So I'm signed for this. There's no people to speak of. I mean, the wars, like in here in the States, they're doing it now, but a little differently. They're taking units over. Then they took people over. So mm -hmm. they drained the units here to send them wherever. And so you had people just coming back or just going over. And most of them were not junior enlisted people. Mm -hmm. They were NCOs and officers. When I came into that unit, I was the... I was the uh, the senior c company grade officer in the battalion. The senior. They had a major, the XO, the battalion, and the battalion commander who outranked me. That's it. The adjutant, or the personnel officer and adjutant was a lieutenant. Uh, signed for all this stuff. First they had to do is do the inventory. And we got it inventoried. And uh, that story gets better as it goes along. Uh, I opened the desk of my office. I never saw the man I replaced. And I opened a door, and there was a door full of half full or empty bottles of Maalox. And I said, hmm, there's something not right here. And so, the commander, Colonel Polano, 
gives me his, my mission statement. Here's what you do, your responsibilities, your OER. Well, supplies got to be in barracks, everything. But never any mention, well, okay, uh, where am I going to get all the people to do that? And, uh, oh, he says, you gotta, we got to gotta use, start using uh, all, of, all the people in the headquarters. Okay, fine. So I do the supply, I do the inventory. Everything's fine. The hand receipts are fine. I run the mess halls, okay. And then we have to, well, it's, what about the barracks? Well, uh, can the headquarters, can the company commander and the first sergeant make sure every troop is keeping his, is that our job directly? I mean, overall responsibility, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have, and Sergeant uh, Ferguson, who I knew in Vietnam on my first tour, uh, in fact, I dealt with him on some of my troops, which is good NCO. I said, sir, we gotta, we got to organize this thing. I think we got to make, the, well, let's, let's uh, make sta uh, uh, Sergeant First Class, the barracks NCO, each, each floor have a, have a squad NCO and uh, morning formations and work details. Sounds like a plan. Let's do it. Oh, man, wailing and gnashing of teeth. I'm not here to know. Uh, you're in the Army. There's still a, we still got to take care of these things. Well, we got the barracks squared away. Uh, there was wailing and gnashing of teeth over this because we'd have a morning formation and they'd tell you the status of the barracks. Now, by this time, were a lot of those uh, men ones who had been in Vietnam and they were sort of at the end? The NCOs of, were, yes. Yeah, and they sort of at the end of their hit, hitch or whatever. And they yeah, were, they were they, unhappy. Yeah. But uh, uh, they, 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 well, see the irony of here. here by rank, you're, you're, you're an experienced person. You're a, you're a platoon sergeant. You're supposed to be able to direct men. Mm -hmm. And why don't you, and you're not doing it. You're sitting up in an office someplace and not even doing anything. There's no mission. Right. It's an aerial reconnaissance. We're not doing reconnaissance in the United mm -hmm. States. You know, we had, we had uh, Mohawks, but they were not issued to us and that's that sort of thing. Uh, so we did that. It... Then I said, well, we've got to get this motor pool. The motor pool's got to be squared away, too. We've got to check that. And so I said, okay, let's uh, uh, come up with a roster, and anyone who's not uh, a, a critical, E5 below, not critical, uh, we'll send him to, to work on these details. Uh, their job was to you know, do inspection of the vehicles and stuff like that. Uh, I, okay, they're doing that. And then the, one of them comes up, the sergeant, they, uh, one of the troops says, sir, we're not doing anything. We're working for the, for the maintenance officer who was not a, ma uh, not a motor maintenance. He was artillery maintenance, which is sort of, that's a typical. They threw people in jobs that never, never had. And so I said, okay, fine. Uh, first sergeant, we want, we want a, 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 a motor, we want a, a buck sergeant like a field first, I want him to go down and supervise the activity in the motor pool. Oh, yeah. the, the, motor, the, the motor pool warrant officer is actually directly responsible to or directly under the S4 in that area, the maintenance and stuff, even though he's part of the that's part of the headquarters company. Mm -hmm. And he was, he, he cries to the, the fat infantry lieutenant who was the S4 for our battalion. Oh, Cap, he's sending these troops, and now he's having his sergeant supervise them. And, uh, and it, they were, all they were doing is taking care of his, his supply uh, hooch, where, I mean, the slips on the, what they call do outs, uh, keeping the supply statistics and not, not keeping the vehicles maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, and that made them, I mean, that I was fighting flack all the time. And of course, he wouldn't, the, the, the uh, S4, that fat lieutenant, wouldn't come to me and 
mentioned that, well, maybe we could come up with some sort of compromise here. No, he goes cries to, the, to Major Roberts or Colonel Polano and, and about the chemical cruise student taking this in, blah, blah. So uh, that was another problem. When next happened is when I, I went in the hospital in the day after Christmas, 1968, which was on a Monday morning, with, uh, with uh, what could have been sacerdosis, could have been, it, they think it was dengue fever, but there was no cases of dengue fever in, in country. So I go, I go into the hospital two weeks. Mm-hmm. That's swelling, and they took x-rays, liver biopsies, and all that stuff. Come back, my battalion commander had let my, mess, uh, my supply sergeant get a drop and his rotation to Germany. So I had to do another inventory. So they give me this uh, uh, Sergeant Adams, E6, as this other guy with E6, to do another inventory, be the ch- and a supply sergeant. So he goes down there and he says, sir, we got big problems, blankets missing, pillowcases, sheets. Mm-hmm. Can't find this, can't find that. And I said, what, what can you do? How can you? Uh, it, uh, how long would it take you think to get this squared away? What do you need? He says, no, sir, I can do it. I, I got connections. I can take care of this. Because he liked coming and working with me because Colonel, uh, Colonel Polano didn't like him because he was fat. Mm-hmm. And they didn't like him because he's fat. So I, he, he says, uh, I'll take care of it. Oh, Colonel Plano, had, now you, you know you can't use people from other units to help you, you know, do these functions, take care of this function. He told me that. I said, yes, sir, I, I will not go out and do that. I never solicit any help. Sergeant Adams had buddies. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the basic training brigade they had there at Fort Bragg at that time. And he got, uh, not the same people every day, but got people who loved to do that except doing monkey mo- doing stuff in basic training. And they know they could get a good meal in my mess hall because mm-hmm. my mess hall was good. My mess hall was good because I made sure it was good with that s- sergeant. You know, we had good food, well, good preparation because I, I had been a, a mess officer in a CERN in Germany back mm-hmm. in, in the 66 time frame, and I knew how to run a mess hall. I knew how to manage those sergeants who tend to be lazy, but anyway. <laughs> so, Sergeant Adams Paul was his first name. He got us squared away. And we had only w- six items missing. OD watches, three, six, six. Mm-hmm. And the only reason that they were, they were mis- known you were missing, you wouldn't have known because the boxes were still on the shelf, was the fact they were gone, but they were controlled items in those days. They hand receipted items. They have serial numbers on them. Well, apparently the previous sergeant during the time frame after I first took over in that had used them for a trading bait or something mm-hmm. and got a... Got ri- uh, they were gone. He left the boxes on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Well, and in the meantime, I, I'm about ready to pack it. And I had uh, I'd already submitted 1049 to get reassigned. I'd mm-hmm. go back to Vietnam. I d- volunteered. And mm-hmm. he couldn't stop that either, by the way, Polano. Mm-hmm. But he says, I'm not letting you out of here until we complete a report, a survey on that, on those missing watches. So uh, we did that, got that done, uh, sent it to Germany, got, went up the chain of command. He signed our plano, went all the way up and over Europe, and they charged Sergeant there for the cost of those OD watches. <laughs> but that was the kind of stuff so he So that thought. would explain why you didn't want to go back to Fort Bragg. I went to Fort Bragg first in 1966, if you mm-hmm. remember. Yep. POR qualification. We're going to Vietnam. Most of the officers I had and most enlisted guys had, n- had no idea what they were going into. No experience. Mm-hmm. 
in this type of work. They're listed particularly. Six months, uh, 30 days on a, 31 days on a troop transport over to Okinawa, for, I mean to uh, Vietnam. Get stuck in sick V. Uh, I come back. Where do they send me when I come back? Fort Bragg. Uh, and so I'm going, I'm going back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I went to, the, went to the CAV. I went to that advisory right. assignment. Right. I'm getting ready to rotate again. You know, get that piece of paper in the mail mm -hmm. six months. Where? Guess where? Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. yeah, not a school, PCS. After, you know, so I, I you know, I'm due for, for, uh, uh, for uh, the career course. So I go to the career course, and then I volunteer right when I went to that course for, they got the pip, piece of paper said that maybe Fort Bragg. Uh, to uh, to go back to Vietnam with a course there mm -hmm. in the in the military assistance advice uh, and mass of course military assistance advisor uh, security something massa Mas I never knew what that be then I went and then the last time in fact before I rotated this is the truth rotated back from Vietnam my second tour guess what. Fort Bragg again. All right. So just on the timeline here, you're, the third tour was July 69 to August 70. Yeah. And then career course was the next, and uh, another course was the next year. Okay. So the, the career course was a, you're, you're, there's a gap there between August 70 and September 71. When yes. You're in the yes. States. That was two courses. Mm -hmm. Massa course first, okay. the career course, then the Massa course, military okay. assistance security advisor course. All right. And and what did those courses actually consist of? So, oh, everything. In the career courses, how to be a captain, how to, okay. all the various functions. That's, that's that. different. Right. And intelligence work. Right. Do a study on various things. Mass, of course, was trained me to be a, a, a Phoenix guy. I went to, mornings were spent in Vietnamese language course. I, after four years, after three years already, now I'm getting Vietnamese mm -hmm. language. Th th there seemed something didn't seem very impractical to me there, but anyway. Uh, how you handle the reporting, uh, the organization. I still got all of I got books, uh, pamphlets and stuff. Uh, I, I Describe can't. a little bit what the basics of the Phoenix program okay. were. Okay. The Phoenix is a program to keep, that, that used to uh, count to neutralize the infrastructure, communist infrastructure in country. It consisted of at the, when I went in at district committees and province committees. District committee in each district, a province, in any province had a district committee, which are made up of police, uh, American advisor, uh, until they converted it into the program called Fung Wong. It was handled by, directly by CIA with a, with a, a special forces mm -hmm. officer, but and when I got in, it was the district had a U U.S. Uh, visor there, MI could be, uh, and each one of the districts depend on the priority. Mm -hmm. And they, their job was coordination with police special branch, census grievance, uh, any other organization within that district which has, has in the general police, for example, the army or whatever, mm -hmm. that the information on Viet Cong Kamalais on routes, villages, uh, communist individual ones, and all these other things. The goal is to neutralize all these so that the war can be expedited. You, in, in my case, as the district, you're responsible for coordinating all the data that comes up for a report they call the Big Mac. And the Big Mac listed uh, uh, all the villages and the communist villages and how, what the status of the infrastructure, Viet Cong infrastructure was, and it was on the big... 80 column sheet for inclusion in the in a uh, in a re, in a uh, on a computer in the old eight column input for these old computers, and uh, we would schedule coordinate operations to maintain the black what they call the black book, and we we started files any your files uh, a blacklist I mean 
you, you start dossier, you know the dossier is mm -hmm. Frenchman, or as the Vietnamese say, ha sho. A dossier on a suspected infrastructure. And you put papers in those, that file anytime you get a report on, on, on this person. Once you get so many, and I can't remember the exact number, two, so, you, you had various, various uh, uh, types of re sources of information that can be vetted, or in other words, determined that it's valuable or maybe ruminant or whatever. And if you get a couple of valued pieces, like uh, his name is listed on a communist document or the interrogation of a, of a, a, a rally or something like mm. that, uh, you put it in there. If you get too many, you put them on the blacklist, and then you can, if you get enough data in there, you can conduct an operation to, to neutralize it. That is to, ba the, the, the ideal, of course, is, is to, to uh, arrest him. Uh, the police special branch, which is like their FBI, mm -hmm. uh, in my province, was the head of the committee. Technically, he's the operational head, the province chief. This is one of the problems with the whole Vietnam thing. All the province chiefs were army, or marines, or, were, uh, or was military mm -hmm. army. District chiefs were, could be, could be marines or whatever, but army. I mean, the military ran everything. Mm -hmm. But anyway. So the, he is a, uh, my, my, my counterpart and last one is a guy named Chan, C-H-N-H. And he says uh, to me right off the top, he says, you'll never get an operation in this counter, I mean, a counter infrastructure operation in this province. It, it, they will never clear the, vi the province in a sector which is the mili the sector is the province chief's military command because there's it's their province chief and it's infiltrated there, there's leaks mm -hmm. and if we do you'll never find anything and we I had one and didn't find anything it was gone uh, couldn't get any operation now when you were in the training program for this uh, were you warned at all that this might be the case yeah yeah, yeah. Well, see, see, the the problem is you have to have a, the you've got to have support of the, 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 the Vietnamese mm -hmm. government, which is the military. Mm -hmm. uh, the province I was in was on the Cambodian border, and and the consensus was that the colonel in charge, Yem, Y E M, a Chinese Vietnamese mm -hmm. person, Chinese and mixed, right. was playing both sides against the middle. And there were sources in he there were infrastructure in his organization. And this came brought home to me because my interpreter, one of them eventually, the first one I had, was the son in law of the province chief. Khan was his name. Mm -hmm. The corporal. Fat. His, fa his father-in-law was fat too. Uh, and he turns out to be a snitch type. He's telling them everything. He, that's why we, anything we, we work on, his, his father-in-law knows about. Mm -hmm. And consequently, nothing, got, nothing happened. So I fired him. I mean, got rid of him. And that definitely put, the door was slammed in my face. Mm -hmm. Counterpart told me that. So we ended up basically getting more neutralizations. That means neutralization, like I said, that by definition, is just is a neutral term. Mm -hmm. But arrest. Uh, killed yeah. in, in a confrontation. Uh, we weren't getting any by arrest, so they were conducting operations 
in the villages around the district and that, and that night there'd be boom, 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 you know, explosions. Well, they had set up ambushes, and they would ambush mostly Kamalas or any v uh, enemy movement in the jungle outside of the villages, uh, and then they'd have documents on them, and we'd say, oh, yeah, infrastructure. Hey, put them on the report card. We got a neutralization. And I've gone down to, I went down to one time uh, down in one of our districts closer to, to uh, uh, Bin Long province on the south part and to Z, uh, it bordered uh, Bin Zung where I was in the calf. Mm -hmm. They got five of them. And, and because, of the, because of the fact that the PRU, which was this re province recon unit, which mm -hmm. was originally, you heard about them under the old CIA Phoenix program that was run by CIA, but usually had special forces people mm -hmm. that actually had uh, they had been taking pictures of uh, having r ralliers, people who were infrastructure, came to the right, came right. out, and having them uh, go uh, like this, and they take their pictures as proof that they killed these people. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that headquarters found out that th they were getting money. They, they'd pay off the guy, give him a couple of bucks to lay, and uh, take the money, because they get good money, American money, for, for, or, or for doing that, and that it was phony. So they told me, you've got you to gotta verify any KIA that is c mm -hmm. considered a, a VCI type, infrastructure type. So I got, had to take a Jeep one time out just west of the head where I was and look. Yeah, there they are, one, two, three, four, whatever that number was. But the other time, the last time most memorable in my mind was flying down to one of the district I was telling you about, and it couldn't get there early in the morning because, uh, you know, it's a little, and you're in the mountains areas, there's a little mist, uh, mm -hmm. clouds. Uh, they want to wait till the cloud, till the, till the fog cleared, and so I drove about 11 o'clock, well, Hey, the body's been laying out in the sun. Oh, God. And I, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So I verified, then they get their money. Okay. Uh, that's, the, that's that. I want to just get a little bit clearer picture here of, of what's going on. So you're basically in this uh, assignment for, for a year. Yep. 71 to 72. And in that time, I mean, now do you actually, does, does anybody actually get to conduct neutralization operations? Or, no. Or do you never get to do any never because get to do the it. province chief doesn't authorize right. it. Right. So you go through the drill. So you can basically, be basically re request to do something. And to get it disapproved. Okay. Uh, now, if an operation were to happen, who would conduct it? Do Americans conduct it or the Vietnamese? No, the Vietnamese. That's under Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Under Phung Wong, it's all Vietnamese. Americans don't go on operations. Okay. So who's setting the ambushes and things like that? They, the Vietnamese are. Okay. When well, is that part That's of the part of the just, just ordinary, the re regional forces and popular forces, which are mm -hmm. responsible for defen defending against VC in general, mm -hmm. soldiers, armed, okay. are c conducting these uh, ambushes on anybody who's moving out in the jungle at night. Uh, and uh, with and then they use an automatic that is trip wired claymores. Boom! Mm -hmm. You come out there in the right. morning. There, that sort of thing. Yeah. That's sort of similar to what American forces have done a lot while patrolling in different areas. Oh yeah. Set up ambushes. There. Okay. So that's really outside of the Phoenix program operation proper. Proper, yeah. Yeah. But it's worth a mark in the scorecard. Yeah. yeah. But it was sort of something at least that you, you could do or pay attention to. Yeah. Because you didn't have. So how did you spend your time that year? Well, that was only for up until. Uh, it was only six months okay. because the Easter offensive, the first of each, so mm -hmm. all hell broke loose. Okay, so yeah, the spring of '72. Yeah, yeah, and it was mostly right, right in the province next to us. However, mm -hmm. uh, they cut the roads. That means no foods coming in. Secondly, uh, the S2, who did S2 work for the for for our unit, he left, so I'm doing his job. Uh, two, they cut the road, uh, 
that that put the kibosh in anything, and we got reports. This is not Phoenix type thing. This is just standard intel that there were tanks in Cambodia, right across up the north of uh, where we were, mm -hmm. and uh, so I there was still ha we still had a, a Phoenix a young lieutenant up there was Phoenix guy, uh, who was uh, up there, and he he uh, I said you got to get you got to verify this you got to react to it. And uh, he went up there. They couldn't find anything. But that's the next day, 1st of April. Guess what happened? Tanks were round down the road right from that area down into, into uh, Bin Long province right next to us. In fact, uh, they were apparently, uh, they had, we had a bridge over the river right south of that district. It was over the, uh, the uh, Dong Nai River. No, no, the Song Bay River, I'm sorry. And they were using the, the bridge to run tanks over, so uh, we, uh, had a, we got an airstrike in to knock it out. And the Air Force came in with their fast movers, and bombs go <laughs> And the Marines came in with their low-level stuff, and they knocked that baby out. They still put a cable across next to it so they could tell mm. The water, you know, like the tank can still go in the water, go across the river. So I just got involved in military things. I, now I had two jobs, and, uh, and that was that was important stuff too. And that became the focus: is what's going on over there uh, in the in the next province. Mm -hmm. And this lasted for ba April, May, and uh, and then the first of June. They decided they, yeah, thir first of June, yeah. They uh, were going to, because by that time, the, they got bombed badly, so, so, much, so bad that it could have been first of July, I can't remember. Yes, it was. They got bombed so badly that, uh, uh, and that they basically pulled back from Ann Lock, and they sent a unit to t smack us. And they attacked one of our districts below districts, and uh, and they cut the road. the the pro the district where the where that P old PRU was. But when they did that, the PRU people coming up to me. I want to get let's get. I want to go to Saigon. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I told by. Not the Saigon, but the guy down in Bang, uh, Bang in uh, uh, Benoit, or well, yeah, it was Benoit. The CIA guy said, "Don't let him on a plane," because CIA controlled Air America, mm -hmm. and the Air America was our only way of getting in and out supplies, for that matter. So uh, they threatened my life, literally. And Turper told me that what they he heard him what they were saying when I couldn't understand Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. They're going to kill you if you don't let them go. So I went to my boss, the colonel, and the colonel went to, up to Colonel Yemen and said that what they had done. He says, if, they, if we hear another word, they're going in the jail. And the jail isn't bars and TVs and weight rooms. It is chicken coop structures mm -hmm. about that tall with, concert, with barbed wire around yeah. it, laying in the mud with the rats. So, uh, they didn't go, and I after it hit, that first day they started banging us with artillery, 152 millimeter, and the RPGs, and of course the district was cut off, and I had to do bomb and crater analysis, drive out in the jeep, and to, and I was I, I I was able to find a crater right across the street. I mean if that guy come down low like that, he wiped us out. And it's in there next to the Catholic Church, big hole. Found all the, found all the uh, uh, pieces of the the big major pieces, which just because of poor machining, they don't. Oh, you yeah, got to be careful how you move around there. Uh, poor, poor, uh, poor machining. It didn't show up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, didn't uh, blow. You know, uh, it broke off. Right. The part of it broke up into the pieces of where the powder was. And there's slices about that big serrator. Boy, if you get those, you're it's all over. And they've got the nose, co got the fuse, and they got the O-ring that covers, holds everything in. 
we got the Air America baby to take him down to Saigon, and they give us a call back on what it was, 152 million. Mm -hmm. So we took care of that, and then I went around and did the, uh, c c on that same mission, went to counting the holes and then doing back asthmas to find out where the direction they, right. they were coming from. Well, anyway, we got the direction. I put it on the map, plot it out, told the, told the colonel and the colonel province chief, and he said, okay, we'll send the Pru. Uh, and the Pru is this lieutenant who was the Pru chief of Vietnamese who was mm -hmm. just lazy. And they went down, and they, they found it right where I said it was, except there was some security for that thing, which it, it was about a battalion side. They got hit with recordless rifles mm -hmm. and everything. The, they captured the lieutenant. The, 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 the troops, this went that mm -hmm. way. The lieutenant went that way. <laughs> uh, and uh, never heard from him again. First of, first of July, yeah. we're g yeah. going to the Easter Offensive. Right. A uh, friend of mine lives in Colorado Springs named Dom Hensley. We came in country together to the Fung Wong program. And he went to, he was up in Bin Long. And he, you want to, this guy's tall. And uh, they, the Vietnamese were amazed by him. He's a Dai Wee Long, New Long, very long, mm -hmm. very tall. And uh, he was there with, during that time, uh, MI officer, but I mean, it was hell over there. Now, I, like I said, the S2 left. So I, be, I took over that job. Mm -hmm. I was in, I had to keep track of, uh, the safes and the classified and all that stuff in addition to being the coordinator. And after that, artillery started falling on the 1st of July, I believe it was 1st of July. Uh, police advisor, he, I, he lived with me and we moved, by the, by the time 1st of July had come, there was already talking, you know, where they're reducing the size. Right. We were down to 15 folks. Mm -hmm. And so they moved us from the real comfortable bunkers that the Army had built for a couple of years earlier mm -hmm. and back into these old uh, a, uh, aid, USA AID, the yeah. civilian things, right. trailers. Mm -hmm. And this cop was a roommate of mine. He had the other end, I had this end. And he, uh, here's a cop. He'd been a cop in New York City, a lieutenant retired. They, that first night they hit, that the 1st of July, they fired the RPGs into our compound. And there were explosions with our artillery. Oh, yeah. This guy's going crazy. He just actually lost it, lost it. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he's got a grease gun. <laughs> grease gun. It, you know, the grease gun's a 45 caliber. You've seen them in World War II. They're Some stamped machine. metal. Yeah. Yeah. You put, pull a trigger and it just sprays all right. over the place. And he's waving this thing around, and he's pointing it at me half the time. I told him to get his, to, the, to that bunker over there. It was one right outside of the, uh, uh, the our, where the trailers come together. There's a platform, and over there on the, off the platform by the fence is the bunker. And so he, he's there. He goes, I get him in there, and then, of course, what, I, I, I'm, about this, I'm this four years. It's making noises. There's nothing hitting me. I best be safe than sorry. So I take my time, make sure I'm getting it done right. You know, I got I got my boots on, I got my flak vest on, I got my weapon and man, bandolier, and I head out. Well, after the, after that, uh, uh, I after in the morning, as soon as it got sunlight, I went out and did my crater analysis, and you know, I poked hole, holes in the road, and I, I hear a clink. That means I hit a. A dud. Mm -hmm. uh, oh boy, that's nice. So I, I did. You do is you take, you, you, you take the hole and you put it the direction where the direction of the bullet is, and you mark it on the map. And you every place there is, and, and where the where the lines cross, that's where it's coming from. Well, that's what we had. We set that operation up. They sent the lieutenant. He got captured. Uh, and then eventually, uh, you know, we 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 cleared the road. And uh, went down on the co with armed convoy. The Air Force had been pounding that whole area between the air ba uh, the district, which had their old air base, uh, airfield, you know, mm -hmm. 3,000 feet of PSP. And you know, there's an old brigade compound where Montagnards had come in, by the way. When the enemy, 1st of April, the Vietnamese, what they do? They left the Montagnards. We're leaving. They left the Montagnards. Uh, they left the sh artillery, 
they didn't spike the guns, they did nothing, they just took off. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, an, I, I uh, went up with a helicopter, Air America helicopter, and watched the Spectre bird, the C-130, you know, you've seen them in the movies in Afghanistan, they got the big, mm -hmm. they got, uh, they had uh, art, uh, 40 millimeters and artillery stuff in it, and blew up the guns and blew up the ammo dump. And the Montagnards eventually struggle, they go in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And, and they eventually all come down, and they, they had the old calf base there, and they put them in there, and they were happy. Uh, so we go down there, we're in a road clearing operation, and they're just craters, both sides of the road. There isn't a stick of lumber uh, on a building standing, except a little pagoda-like structure with, you know, most Vietnamese, uh, if they aren't Catholic, they're sort of animist slash Buddhist slash mm -hmm. whatever. And there was one of those left, and the Vietnamese were all upset, you know, oh, this is haunted or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, this is evil it's, uh, or whatever. You know, this is um, uh, the gods have visited us, mm -hmm. so I came. But anyway, you go to the airfield, and again, we're looking at the airfield damage, and all of a sudden, boom. So I dive, I, I'm closer to the little traffic control, it's the same building that the, the cab used, nobody's mm -hmm. really staying in there. Right next to there's a garbage pit, sort of like what the Vietnamese used to throw the food in when they, whoever manned that uh, control tower, it was a little hot but building. And so I drove in there, oh, smell. I was just stunk all over. We come down the road though. They were they were dropping the bombs yet when I came down the road. Uh, uh, some fragmentation would land on the roofs of the building. We stand underneath the, the, you know, like the front porch type thing of the structures, oh, the, and and the stuff would tinkle all over the, mm -hmm. the roof. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I watched them bombing the. We had a big. We had Nui Ba, right right. You could see it from the from our compound, the Nui Ba Ra, which is the old, was the grandfather mountain or something mm -hmm. like that. And the Vietnamese had uh, had a, an intercept facility on there. And uh, they were telling us what, there were tanks. And my, my province chief, my province senior advisor, the colonel said, how come we're not getting that information through U.S. China? And what, what, they, what they're told is, well, you don't have clearance, so you need to know. And he'd go, Colonel Whalen just went, absolutely. Here we are, we're getting shot at. We're getting, with, uh, with artillery and, and, and RPGs, the enemy is trying to take that thing, and they're telling us it's a tank unit, and there are tanks, and you can't tell us what it is. What did he do? And we captured these these uh, APCs, which the the Viet, the NVA had got from the Americans when they abandoned, you know, the probably Ninth Division, which was the one that that was operational in that whole area, uh, probably had abandoned the Viet, and then they took them, used them. The 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 the, the, the little the the PFs and the RFs and they had that. Everybody had after the first of April, they came in with boxes of these laws. Every little law. It was a light anti tank weapon? Yeah, yeah. And you, it's plastic mm -hmm. or material. And you could go, oh, you can, I'm left hand, sir. And it cracks. It's a loud noise, but it will penetrate. APCs, they just eat them up. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, we, we captured three of them and they towed them in, and set them up in, the, our, uh, in our compound, next to our compound, and I took some pictures of those two. Uh, and, uh, then of course we later on we, uh, the the events what really started what was really interesting is that during this first after first July they attacked this this one of these uh, platoons P, this is a PF platoon mostly Montagnards that had set up just to the I, I guess it'd be to the west of the of the district compound and there it was a uh, U.S. had constructed or helped construct this designed this thing, had uh, the, the triangular compound, and then they had, uh, had uh, 
trenches connecting each each one in the underbound and the, these people, this platoon, defended itself. They never overrun it. Uh, and uh, they, they made a strategic withdrawal when the, the Air Force had talked to us uh, when the offensive started at the 1st of April, mm -hmm. that uh, we got these, uh, we got the type of ordinance we can provide you assistance with mm -hmm. if you're, in case you're attacked. And there's some other, this is one of them. One is this bot, what they call a gas bomb. That's the same type of bomb they used in the tunnel, in the caves, and mm -hmm. except a smaller version. And they had never used that thing before, uh, th before Vietnam. So they said, yeah, we can, we, we, it, it, that, that we could use that. And that was also the, at the same time they said, here we have a, uh, what you call a transponder, that if in case th things get dicey, flip the switch, and we can provide you support, but we'll have a signal knowing exactly mm -hmm. where you are at all times so we don't do you in, basically. So we had that in the, uh, in fact, when the 1st of April, 1st of uh, July, they flipped that switch. Uh, and that, sp that specter bird just, that's awesome. That red, you've seen it in the videos and that, that's a, it's not the, art, they weren't firing the, the artillery round so much, mm -hmm. the, you know, that 105, they were firing this, these, uh, I think they're probably 20 caliber mini guns, mm -hmm. the Gatlings. And they, that, it looks like a laser. Just, So that's just. It just, just they followed around. Yeah. They, so it kind of clears an area around yeah. you and it keeps everybody away from yeah. it. Precisely. Okay. Uh, and they, that gas bomb, they use that. Now, was what, that using like a, like a tear gas kind of thing? It's, no, it's a heavy gas. What it does is they, they had the guys, the guys were pulled back. Mm -hmm. They pulled back, and the enemy's there, right? And they go, oh, well, we, we got it now. Well, they drop the bomb. What you see is you see the canister fall, mm -hmm. and, then, and, it, and it hits, and you see dust, and then all of a sudden what happens, the gas is in the canister, and it spreads. It's heavy, and all of a sudden you hear boom, and a big dust cloud. What happens? Anybody in the trenches is blown. It's brains through the ears, you know, this sort of thing. Overpressure bomb. Mm -hmm. And it's great for, for that sort of thing. It just spreads all over where there's a hole or, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a trench or that. It just spreads so it's throughout. So just a massive concussion, essentially? Massive concussion, and humans can't can stand that. Yeah, because yeah. it's not one that we hear a whole lot about. No. Yeah. Uh, they did, you, they saw, you saw the videos and that they took of uh, when they were after Osama bin Laden, and mm -hmm. they had that type of bomb they used in those caves. All right. Uh, now, at this point, we've run a long session here today, yeah. and, and we're going to come and, and do another one, uh, and this is going to give us, I think, a reasonable break point. So we'll start it next time, and I want to get back in and ask some more questions about what's going on in 71, 72, okay. and we kind of work from there in, into what's okay. next. So in the meantime, that will do for today.